Hello, me again. I will be very frank with you. I've been in the cosmetic industry for quite a few years now, and every year, for those of you in the public that don't know, there are doctors and, and, and companies that speak at events or they will put events on in the background to, to tell people, you know, professionals, about things like thermal fillers and, and hyaluronic acid, to name just a couple of things. Now, when it's at a sponsored event, you can bet money on the education being biased. But unfortunately, even when it's at a, at a non-sponsored event, like, like a training course or a conference somewhere, even if it's not biased, the quality of that education coming out of the speaker's mouth is not great, sometimes at least. I've sat through far too many talks from people who just don't have a clue about what they're talking about or why certain things are the way they are, biology, chemistry, physics, etc. I've seen far too many instances where I've asked a question about something I, I know the answer to, just to check that the speaker knows what they're talking about so that I can trust what I'm learning. And you know, practically every time or most of the time, I've been significantly underwhelmed and even appalled at times by the answer. Um, or, or even you know lack of answer in in some cases. And unfortunately, I find that this actually perpetuates itself and and it lends the medical industry to giving education mainly based on who spoke at the last event or who's got a good number of followers on social media or who managed to make friends with the right people in the last year or which company can can sponsor me the most for this project I'm doing. And one of the results of this is that people end up using crap products on their completely unaware patients. Honestly, and, I, and th this is gonna be controversial to most if not all of my colleagues, but most thermal fillers, most skincare products, most skin boosters, etc., are absolute piles of shit. Clinicians buy them because they, they don't have the knowledge to be able to distill one thermal filler from another and the reps will sell them because they genuinely believe the rubbish that they're told by the company that they work for. So many people do say that they're all the same. I mean, they are in the sense that most of them are crap, but they mean it in the sense that what's inside the syringe is the same too. And the truth just could not be further from that. Chemically, there's, there's actually such a huge divide between dermal fillers in terms of what's actually inside the syringe. And if you understand this on a really fundamental scientific level, your patients are much better off. I genuinely believe your career is much better off and, and the entire industry will be forced to improve product quality because people are just gonna stop accepting crap products with, with crap chemistry inside the syringe. So this video is, is going out because I, I want to combat the pandemic of crap education, biased education, uneducated speakers, crap products, patients getting fooled, and be companies considering marketing budgets as being more important than research and development budgets. If you're already using a thermal filler like, say, Reven-S, I salute you for prioritizing your patients and, and, and choosing to value quality over profit. There will be more depth of knowledge in this video than any other out there on the same topic in the world. I know that's a bold claim, so I don't make it nonchalantly. I'm gonna go through everything you need to know, which is all up to date at the time of making this anyway, to uh, understand what a hyaluronic acid actually is, because trust me, even some filler companies don't know, don't know that from what I've seen. Uh, where it came from, um, what, what it actually does, which is a big question, how it's produced and made and, and how it's actually turned into a dermal filler. And I'm gonna actually compare different fillers without being afraid to name them individually either. Everything you're about to see is entirely off the top of my head. There's no script. All of it is gonna be done in one take, uh, mainly because I'm lazy, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, the only thing I have in front of me just here um, is, is a piece of paper with some, some bullet points on, so I know what order to speak about things in. 
um, and also a, a bottle of a uh, bottle of water and electrolytes here because my mouth is going to get in inevitably quite dry and just a small monitor here so I can make sure I'm still in the frame. Um, I hope you find it enjoyable as well as educational and if you have any questions please comment down below or, or speak to me in person if you ever see me and I would really really appreciate if you could send this to any colleagues that could benefit from it too. If I can make even just one doctor I think twice before putting out crap education or, or, or choosing a crap product, all of this will have been worth it. Um, I'm going to start by, by looking at really the basics and, and, and the history of it because that's important to know where it came from. So hyaluronic acid is what we call a, a polysaccharide and it was discovered about 80 years ago at the time I'm making this anyway. And polysaccharides or if you like polycarbohydrates, they're long chain carbohydrates and they're bound with something called a glycosidic bond. We'll, we'll get to what those bonds are later. But biopolymer is the common, or like the general name, for bio, biological macromolecules, which include you know, proteins, nucleic acids in the DNA, and in this case, polysaccharides. They were, they were first isolated, I believe, in, in 1918 by Levine and Lopez Suarez, um, but it wasn't actually called HA back then. They were first written about um, in, a, in, a, in an old reference uh, that I, I think it's Meyer and Palmer 1934 and that was actually in, in the context of a, a cow eyes, bovine eyes, where they extracted it from and, and it talks about this really odd new polysaccharide that had a really high molecular weight um, and over the next 10 years after that they, they managed to extract it from lots of different animal organs as, as well as the eyes and the picture slowly built up of this really mysterious yet essential molecule that we, we just can't be without because it's found in so many places. Nowadays though, hyaluronin is actually the modern name. Uh, more people call it hyaluronin than, than hyaluronic acid. Now you may have heard of another type of polymer that, that some people get confused with hyaluronic acid and, and that's mucopolysaccharides. These are isolated from mucus, hence the name obviously. And they have a, a really strong lubrication property and that's related to their, their ability to absorb water. Uh, I say that in, in quote marks because you'll understand what I mean by that later. I know a lot of you are sat there thinking, oh, I know about HA and its ability to attract water, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, in this video, you're gonna learn that it, it doesn't really attract water directly. Um, you have to use metals to do that properly. Um, but we'll, as I said, I'll get to that later. Um, don't worry, there'll be a lot of myth busting here. So HA is, is found in, in literally all body tissues. I know in this, in this cosmetic context, people think of, of skin, and yes, it's in skin, but it's actually in every other tissue too. Just think about that for a second, please. If all it did was hydrate you, why would it be found in every single body tissue when the bloodstream can bring water if needed? It's used in so many biological processes. You, you cannot even begin to imagine how useful it is for us as, as human beings. It helps us you know, control cell activity, cell division, cell migration, chromatin structuring, um, controlling the activation of the genome. I'm gonna show you all of that today. And if you think, oh, I, don't, I don't need to know all that, I promise you you're wrong. Because if you don't know that, you won't have a clue what the dermal fillers or, or skin boosters or, or whatever that you're injecting or rubbing in are actually and fully doing, which I'm, which I'm very, very passionate about, as you can tell. Now, shortly after all of this happened, it became so fascinating in the early 1930s that it was then isolated from strains of streptococcus groups A and C. You may not find this that interesting, but the importance of it, I, I promise you, it cannot be overstated. Today, in the 21st century, strep bacteria actually the most economical and reliable source for mass producing hyaluronic acid, whether it be for skincare, um, dermal fillers, skin boosters, research, drugs, etc., etc. And even the enzyme that breaks it down, hyaluronidase, is equally fascinating. I know that nowadays more and more people talk about filler dissolving, using hyaluronidase being something to worry about. I think I've got a cold. Um, and, and that there's all sorts of consequences that we have to worry about when we use it and stuff. But even though that's, that's all correct, this is something that's been known for almost a century, actually. 
way back when I first started out in aesthetics, even I, even back then, I knew that dissolving like there's no tomorrow would have serious consequences. The fact that it's news to people nowadays, just it goes to show you know, how uh, little people know about HA and, and, and dermal fillers in general. In, uh, I think it was uh, Duran Reynolds, 1928, we got uh, from that paper some information which explains a lot about you know, a century before today, the reason hyalase can cause so many issues when dissolving fillers, especially around the eyes. That paper showed us an experiment where they took black Indian ink mixed with hyalase and they injected it subcutaneously. They saw rapid, quick distribution of the product, literally through the connective tissue. So not around it, but actually through it. Remember that every tissue in the body has HA in it. This is so crucial to understand for, for when we're injecting into the face near connective tissues like you know, ligaments and, and, and SMAS layers. Um, the enzyme will depolymerize the chain into individual HA monomers, which, which originally daisy chained together to make the original, the, the big hyaluronin polymer. The enzyme is increasing the permeability of the connective tissue because of its inherent depolymerization activity going through it that isn't just limited to the HA lying outside the cell's environment. And, and this is the way that we found out what the, the actual individual monomer of HA was, which chained up to make the polymer. But at the same time, it's, uh, you know, it, it's the reason we get such awful results when people who, who don't know this decide to dissolve filler without knowing the best way to do it. And, and, and give dissolving a bad name. Uh, I've dissolved previous filler treatments um, for, for patients of mine many times over the years, and I've never had any issue with things looking you know, ex extremely saggy uh, or loose or, or even kind of hollow or, or cavitated afterwards. Um, maybe I should make a video on that sometime, I don't know. Um, if you watch this video and, and pay attention, uh, I guess you won't need a video like that anyway, um, because if I've done my job right, you should be able to work all this out for yourself by the end. Um, but anyway, yeah, a, a while after the 1930s, when people started to realize what this thing is, we discovered something really important for dermal fillers, which we all see on the marketing material every day. Uh, Oxford 1951 is a paper that, that described for the first time what this mysterious high molecular weight molecule did in aqueous solution. They wrote that you know, if you increase the concentration of it in a solution, then you get a more viscous mixture. But they showed that this wasn't because the chains had some different structure. It was because the neighboring chains all started to just inter interlace together, entangle with each other. Uh, you know, nowadays, we, we actually call this entanglement. It's like adding, um, say, say, more hairs in, in, into the bathroom. They all just get entangled with each other and this big blob of hair forms, and that's why the drain gets blocked. That the more entanglement you have in polymers, the harder it is for them to flow, um, which we can label as being viscous. This is why a, a lot of companies increase HA concentration from the thinnest to the, 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 the thickest product in the range, uh, because they, they don't know any other way to do it. But if you, if you increase HA concentration, then you also necessarily change the properties that it exhibits in the environment, the cellular environment that it's placed in, as you'll find out over, over the course of this video in great detail. So someone who figures out how to change rheology without changing HA concentration clearly has some fantastic chemistry on their side, as you'll also learn here. You know, even when you dissolve it in things other than water, or, or even water, but with other things in it, it actually starts to take on completely different characteristics. People started to uh, experiment with dissolving it in, in different organic salts and saw different rheological properties. The highest viscosity they can make was actually with pure distilled water. Um, the behavior difference was put down to the 
the different solutions having like different acidity values or pH values, um, if you like, and, and the and the ionic strength of the solution. Uh, and for those not chemically minded, if you don't know um, what ionic strength is, basically it just means that the concentration of ions in that solution, because ionic compounds, um, like even you know ordinary table salt like sodium chloride, they can dissociate and ionize in in solution into separate sodium and chloride. Nowadays, in the scientific community, we, we know this phenomenon as common knowledge. But there are still clinicians who inject fillers and wonder why different people get slightly different reactions or characteristics from the same filler. It's because each person's extracellular matrix, the ECM, is going to be very slightly different because of things like you know, age, disease, uh, diet, the previous treatments, skin care, uh, medication, sun damage, all sorts of things. I won't, I won't go too long, but you get the idea. And even the presence of other polysaccharides can play a role. In fact, all polysaccharides actually have a sulfate group in their structure, except HA. It's the only non-sulfated polysaccharide we know of, or that I know of anyway. I'm sure someone will, will correct me in the comments. Uh, one of the consequences of this, though, is that it can accelerate cell growth and it can initiate cell aggregation, amongst other things. This shows us the, the unique binding that it has to, to cell membranes that other polysaccharides don't have. As a scientific community, we, we took this further. And I think it was, <clears throat> I think it was probably in the 70s, right? The 1970s, <clears throat> when we for the first time we actually injected it in some way. If I'm not mistaken, it was first and on racehorses who, as you can probably imagine, have immense mechanical stress going through their joints. And the stress wore away fluids that kept the joint working smoothly. And part of the reason we have this smooth functioning of joints is due to the synovial fluid in the joint, acting as a sort of lubricating mechanism that contains high amounts of HA. So when these racehorses developed arthritis and, and lost some of this fluid, the experiment was to inject it back into that area. Now it's going dry already. Now, it had a positive effect, and that is where we really started to think about where else could we inject it. But it's not as simple as thinking, where is HA found? Okay, let's inject it there. If you do that, there are times when you can actually do harm as well. But this was a, a golden opportunity at the time to really start exploring and researching what else this substance could do. Since then, it's obviously become, you know, the, the, the gold standard in, in multiple fields like ophthalmology and, and cosmetic medicine, as well as becoming, quite frankly, a bit of a marketing joke for crap companies to stick the label hyaluronic acid onto crap products and, and prey on the fact that people generally don't know very much about it, like how to spot when it's a waste of time because videos like this aren't around. You know, for example, most people are under the impression that it's this uh, silent thing and it just sits there and it helps hydrate the tissue. Every time I see or hear that, I, I, I just put my head into my hands and I, and I struggle to believe that even you know, fully qualified clinicians go around saying things like this or that massive companies get away with advertising it as that to the general public. What an absolutely crap landscape we live in where misinformation like that can spread so easily uh, and be gobbled up even easier. I still struggle to just admit that here, you know, while I'm filming, to be honest. I can't, I can't describe how angry I get when people get called experts and they spout complete and utter nonsense at the instant. I find it so disrespectful to the people that have come to you to learn and better themselves. You know, this is, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm making this. I'm fed up of, of, of no one standing up and, and, and talking with any kind of depth on the subject. To say that it's a hydrator is a complete waste of everyone's time. There's absolutely no way on earth that it's an inactive macromolecule in a cellular environment it's, it's, a, it's an active biopolymer that's responsible for contributing massively 
to our overall complete organismal homeostasis in every tissue of our being. And it deserves to be treated with an amount of respect that is directly proportional to that. And, and another myth that, that I, I keep hearing is, is that your body turns over all your HA every day. I've heard doctors that companies hail as experts stand up on stage at global conferences and say this. Um, I'm going to one tomorrow, I'm sure I'll hear the same. Um, I, I just, I sit there and I shake my head. The, the, you know, even the first time I heard it. The truth is that the polymer has a half-life. In joints, it's around one to 30 weeks. In, in skin, it's about one to two days. Bloodstream is about two to five minutes. A half-life simply means that after the elapsed time, half the amount, half the original amount is still there just as at the start. And in general, about five to seven grams of hyaluronic acid in an adult 70 kilogram man is cleaved and synthesized every day which represents, you know, roughly speaking, about a third of the entire body's content. Now, there are, there are many enzymes that do the breaking down of this for us. I know most doctors talk about hyaluronidase breaking it down, uh, but there are actually multiple options. Endogluconase in the form of hyaluronidase is one option. And there are several forms of this in the body, like lysosomal hyaluronidase, as an example. Um, exogluconases like uh, beta-glucuronidase and uh, beta-N-acetyl-hexosaminidase are, are other types. Even bacteria have their own innate ability to degrade this, this polymer with things like streptomyces hyaluronidase. In fact, in the body, you know, hyal 1, 2, and 3 are the main enzymes that we know about for this context, for, for our context in, in this video. It's about H-Y-A-L and, and then the number. Um, we also have HIAL 4 and 5. Um, they're, they're not too relevant for us in this video, and, and neither is something called HIAL P1, which is well beyond the, the, the scope of, of this lecture. Uh, I'll go on for a couple of days. And, and it's, it's more like a pseudogene, that one. It doesn't actually code for the enzyme, uh, as far as I'm aware. Uh, now, if you remember well, going back, I, I said that it was, HA was first written about in, in Meyer and Palmer 1934, when they discovered it in animals. It took literally just, luckily, a few years after that with Kendall 1937 to then extract it from the, the culture liquid of Streptomyces bacteria. I think they used acetic acid uh, and ethanol to bring it out, which um, I, I admit it may sound like an unnecessary nerdy detail that only I would enjoy, but to me it's, it's really important because we use principles like that in modern factories today to extract the raw product out of the bioreactors that the HA is made in before being shipped to filler companies and then being shipped to us to inject in our patients. I'm gonna go through all that later too so you understand what it is that you're actually putting into someone's face, don't worry. Um, now, it all sounds great that, that we can extract it from bacteria and that we've done it for a long time, since 1937, almost 100 years now. But what it means is that the mammalian hyaluronic acid exists among several types of strep bacteria that are pathogenic to humans and animals. If you don't understand the consequence of this, then just think about this for a second. I've already mentioned just now that we can use strep bacteria to produce raw hyaluronic acid for us that, that we use in skincare fillers, uh, skin quality enhancers or skin boosters, whatever you want to call them, etc. Um, but I'm also saying that these bacteria are pathogens to us. So if we're using them to secrete hyaluronin, but that hyaluronin we extract isn't pure, then what if we create a pathogenic liquid that we inject into someone's face? This is a, a worthy and obviously a, a legitimate concern. And this is the reason uh, HA production and fermentation is an art in itself. Uh, a complete art form and, and it's it's so bloody difficult to get a completely 100% pure product and yet that's exactly what we want because of the pathogenic potential. I think the term that describes the situation well is, is saying uh, I think it's called playing with fire because that's, that's kind of what we're doing in, in, in this aspect and when different filler brands place different levels of emphasis on this and have different uh, qualities of end products is it any wonder that papers like Acosca 2022 show an obviously higher incidence rate when using brands like Juvederm? 
you know, you, you're not going to be surprised to hear that I absolutely hate Juvederm with, with every essence of my being. And if I can help it, there's no way on earth I'd ever use it on anyone. It belongs in the bin, frankly. And with everything you're going to learn in this video, I, I think and hope you'll come to the same conclusion eventually. Um, even if you take my opinion out of it and, and just look at the, the objective learning points here. If you're still using it after learning everything that's in here, then my guess is that you're either being paid to use it and or being paid by the company to work with them uh, and or you, you maybe get some sort of really heavy discount on it. Uh, sorry, before I get sidetracked too much, um, we'll go back to the production of it. I, I, I do talk about Juvederm and other fellow brands later on if you're interested to hear about um, someone actually naming brands and saying things about them. But um, uh, the production, yeah. So initially we extracted it from animals and, and for a time that was okay for us. But as you can probably guess, you know, demand has increased so much since then. And, and it's not, it's just not economically viable or, or even ethical to keep taking it from animals, unfortunately, at the rate at which we need it. And that's why we, we have learned to use bacteria now even though there's a, a pathogenicity risk. In fact, the first time we really tried to grow out of bacteria, I think it was uh, Roseman 53, Roseman 1953. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that though, so someone will inevitably correct me in the comments below and make me look an idiot um, if I've got that wrong. Uh, but, but either way, you know, there's a yield that they got at the time, I think, was around 200 to 300 milligrams out of four liters of cultural liquid. So in other words, you know, they got a, like a quarter of a filler syringe out of 4,000 syringes worth of cultural liquid. Now obviously, clearly, that's an absolutely terrible yield and, and it would not cut the mustard today. But that's where we've come from, you know, and, and what we have today is extraordinary compared to that. And as I said, uh, I'll, I'll show you what we have nowadays. Uh, and as you can guess, where there's a money-making opportunity, there are uh, patents everywhere. Uh, HA production and application is obviously going to be no exception to that. There's been uh, more than 20 patents, as far as I'm aware, that have something to do with, with cultivating hyaluronin from uh, Streptococcus equi, uh, the species name, from uh, around sort of the mid-1980s to, to at least when I was in primary school in sort of the early 2000s. Um, e even with all this though, supply still doesn't meet demand because of just how much this molecule is marketed all around the world nowadays. I remember when I was in, in uni once um, in Leeds uh, looking up that the price once somewhere, and I think it was around something like $10,000 for one kilo of raw product. Uh, now that still leaves a huge margin of profit for the filler companies even when you take into account all the costs of, of selling and, and marketing, etc. So now that it's, it's been some time since I saw that price, potentially it's, it's come down even more now. Uh, in terms of just production, it'll cost companies probably somewhere in the range of around, I don't know, 10 to $20 per syringe, I'd say, I'm, I'm just guessing. Um, someone like Allegan, who, who buy in absolutely huge quantities for Juvederm, I'd say might even get it for, for less than that, or, or possibly just at the bottom end of that range. Uh, then you look at the fact that they charge between, I don't know, 200 to 300 pounds for some of their fillers. You can see the absurd markup they get away with because of their incessant marketing. Uh, a reasonable price that I would advise you to look for that isn't stupidly overpriced, but that isn't also so cheap you, you don't feel comfortable using it, um, is probably around sort of 50 to 80 pounds per syringe, I'd say. Uh, and, and that's when you take into account everything that you will learn in this video. Uh, the reason it can't realistically go much cheaper than that without calling into question uh, the, the product quality is because the enzymes that we're using, which are responsible for the metabolism uh, or, the, or the, the, the production of hyaluronic acid, aren't easy to use. Um, we, we've studied them since the 1950s when we first found the hyaluronate synthase enzyme, um, which was shortened to HAS, uh, H-A-S, um, in the strep pyogenes bacteria. Uh, there's been quite a few attempts 
to get that Has enzyme into other organisms. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, at least, nothing's really stuck, to be honest, so far, uh, even after all this time and all the advancements we've had since then. Um, the only kind of milestone that we have in this area is De Angelis 1993. Now, anyone who's seriously interested in hyaluronan absolutely knows this paper like a Bible. Paul De Angelis and his work that, that was um, published in 1993 is the main reason we have the ability to control bacteria into producing all these wonderful HA products that we have all over the world nowadays. Paul and his team were the first people to find, uh, isolate, characterize, and, and clone the Has enzyme in such a way that it could then be used by a microorganism that previously had no ability to produce HA at all. Complete breakthrough. And you know, he's one of those scientists that I just cannot wait to meet one day. Uh, I, I know I'm going to have an absolute fanboy moment and stutter over my words and, and drop my phone as I, as I ask for a selfie. But, uh, you know, the, the significance of his work it, it cannot be overstated in any way. Uh, if you ever meet him, shake his hand and thank him for all the income that you've gained to, to, to feed your families. Um, and, and thanks to for all the industries that he's basically given rise to almost single-handedly. Um, well, him and his team. You know, there's, there's such a wide range of applications that we use HA4 nowadays and a, a wide range of benefits it can have for us. It's, it's anti-inflammatory, it's disinfecting, it's wound healing, it's epithelially regenerating, it, it can prevent granulomas, um, it can prevent adhesions, uh, scars, uh, swelling, itchiness, can, it can normalize blood circulation even, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Our uses of HA in aesthetic medicine are, are the equivalent of, of buying a supercar capable of going like 250 miles an hour and just driving at two miles an hour everywhere we go. However, you know, that car can still go 250 if, uh, even if we only drive it two all the time. And the analogy of the car going at two miles an hour is like the never ending list of doctors that pretend to know a lot about HA by saying, it can hydrate you and it can hold on to water. But the car still retains the ability to do a whole lot more than just hydrate, whether we intend for it to or not. And, and, and you know, this is why it's so important to understand more about hyaluronin in, in, in such a way um, that we can explain clinical findings, that ones that go well, ones that go badly. Um, and we can choose better thermal fillers. We can choose better skincare. We can use it for, for more than we think to help our patients. And we can spot the clinicians in our field that aren't worth listening to. I genuinely cannot believe the absolutely appalling HA knowledge level of people who teach dermal fillers. It's a disgrace. And through videos like this, I'd like to fight that pandemic and arm people, not just professionals, but the public as well, hopefully, for, for, for you know, with, with better knowledge and for free. So we'll, we'll go into the, the, the biological role of hyaluronic acid. Um, this is really deep and important. To get started, I'll, I'll, I need to tell you that HA is considered one of the earliest evolutional forms of the polysaccharide family. The fact that it's universal across species shows us how old it is, how crucial to life on Earth it is, and why using different species to make it as per De Angelis 1993, it's not a problem. Our, our bodies will react the same, whether it was made by us or, or bacteria. So, you know, patients that, that come to you and say, I can't put foreign things in my body for religious reasons, they have absolutely no logic to what they're saying. What you have in your body is identical to what's foreign anyway. And the energy that's um, required to make these products comes from mitochondria, which most likely started off as a foreign organism that we enveloped and developed a symbiotic relationship with anyway. These same patients probably use skincare that has HA inside. Where the hell do they think that comes from? It's most likely the exact same type of non-human source that we get for fillers as well. You know, in our modern world, we, we classify living organisms based on their methods of nutrition, which is determined by polysaccharides. And it's something in the external 
cell membranes or cell walls. For example, um, cellulose only allows water, inorganic compounds, and gases through. Cellulose is, is it's the main component in plant cell walls, if you don't know. And, and because of these properties, plants acquired the ability to carry out photosynthesis of organic compounds to give themselves autonomous nutrition, which is a, a technical term. Um, you know, this played a big role in, in plant evolution over time. Other cell types evolved a cell wall made of, of something called chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. You know, this allows the organism to consume high molecular weight organic compounds. This allowed them to consume decomposing organic material. And this is now what we call a fungus or fungi, plural. You know, this, this chitin is seen heavily in invertebrates, whereas hyaluronic acid and, and other glycosaminoglycans are found in animals in the chordata phylum, like Homo sapiens. This should allow you to see how important it is to understand the interaction between hyaluron and, and, and our cells uh, in, in both dermal fillers and skin care. It, it literally determines the cell activity and therefore the function of, of, of the entire organ. So it's a complete head in hands moment for me when I hear people say, oh, it's this thing that, that sits there and it attracts water. It, it literally helps determine the function of that entire tissue. And if you pick the wrong type, then you get unintended clinical changes or observations. Now you should start to see why sometimes you get things like more swelling and, and inflammation or, or, or delayed onset nodules. And other times you get nothing. One of the reasons it's so universal across so many species and, and homologous too, is that glucose through evolution became a substrate for nutrition across so many species, you know, around, I think it was about 570 million years ago, the, the gene that coded for hyaluron and synthase came into being. Finally, then, we had an enzyme that, that was capable of breaching the activation energy barrier to link together specific carbons in a hexose or, or hexagonal structure. From there, glucose is ultimately turned into hyaluronic acid using hyaluronic synthase enzymes as the final step. You know, this is, in fact, this is why um, diabetic patients seem to, at least in my personal experience, have worse skin in, in general or on average. Skin has most of the HA in the body uh, and HA is highly linked to glucose levels in terms of its, its production and, and, and physiology. And remember that diabetes can be thought of as a, as a dysregulation in, in, in glucose levels, for this context at least. Diabetes actually has an effect uh, on their collagen too, and, and then the linking between strands using bases like, like proline. Uh, but, but that's very advanced, I shouldn't have said that, and then that's for a, a different video too. Um, but you know, I hope, are, are you starting to see now how it's, it's appalling for people to just say, oh, hyaluronic acid is for hydration. It actually affects our, our physiology, our metabolism, our, our growth, our, our communication, et cetera, et cetera. And, and depending on what HA type is outside the cell in the ECM, the extracellular matrix, we get a certain change in the cell. Depending on what other products are in the ECM alongside hyaluronin, we can either struggle or succeed in, in making the desired changes that we want and, and even control very, very specifically what type of change we're creating. Um, this is crucial in, in order to see why so many products in the market are crap, as well as in, in many aspects being the same as each other with just, shall we say, differing levels of marketing in there uh, to make clinicians, they're, they're buying something special. <coughs> Point of times. Uh, but before we carry on, uh, I'm gonna list some basic features of hyaluronin and uh, other glycosaminoglycans. They're all linear, non-branched polysaccharides, uh, unlike glycogen, as an example, which is used as an energy store for us because it can be branched storage. So hyaluronic acid is pretty much going to be straight for the purposes of this conversation um, until we get to later on. All glycosaminoglycans are built from repeated disaccharide units, which means they're made of two different individual sugars and that combo of two 
is then repeated. This is what we call a, a heteropolysaccharide. A monopolysaccharide is a repeat of a single individual sugar, like um, starch, glycogen, and, and cellulose are all made from repeating uh, glucose units, glucose monomers, if you like. For example, hyaluronic acid is a repeat, a, a polymer of glucuronic acid and N-acetylglucosamine. And that combo of these two is what's repeated. Um, all glycosaminoglycans, except hyaluronic acid, contain sulfate groups. I think I mentioned that early, um, earlier. The, the, the amino group, which is part of HA that has a nitrogen in it, is usually acetylated. An acetyl group is a small structure uh, based on, on, on carbon and, and, and hydrogen. Um, nitrogen is also quite positive. So when this amino group has a neutral acetyl group on it, you take away the positive charge and leave the molecule neutral. But because hyaluronic acid doesn't have an acetyl group where the nitrogen is, nitrogen's positive charge is left unchanged. And the whole HA molecule is, is actually slightly positive in electrical charge at that point uh, on the molecule. Um, so to listen very carefully, HA has a positive electrical charge. This may mean nothing to you, but it plays a huge role in, in product design and, and product choice when it comes to treating your patients, which we'll, we'll come to later on. This, this nit nitrogen is positive, okay? Remember that um, in this context. Glycosaminoglycans differ from other polysaccharides in key areas. For example, they're soluble in water. Other polysaccharides are either partially soluble or insoluble. This is why we get a glycosaminoglycan like HA for dermal fillers. And, and HA is then further distinguished from other polysaccharides by the fact that it's, it's not got a sulfur group on it. It's, it's not modified after synthesis. It has a high molecular weight, and it can be found in a free-floating state. Now, this is important, because now that we, we, we understand this, we can see that people who try and come up with new and random formulations in skincare and injectables that combine the HA with all sorts of random things, which it's not naturally combined with because it's unmodified after synthesis, are potentially making a little rubbish, just so they can make something that looks different to the rest of the market for the sake of looking different and nothing more. Uh, I mean, that describes half the industry, frankly. Um, and, and another important point we'll, we'll get back to later is, is that the enzyme that makes it, hyaluronin synthase, is situated on the inside of the cell membrane. And as the HA is being manufactured, it's pulled through the membrane and into the ECM outside. Think of it like um, silk being made inside a spider and gradually being pulled through into the outside world by its legs. Um, this means, critically, that if the ECM quality, the exosolar matrix, the area where the HA is being poured into, if the, if the quality of that is poor, then the ability of the cell to do its job is poor. That's why things like mesotherapy only give a short-term result at best. You know, and, and other products which I'll touch on that go after ECM remodeling give more intense quicker and longer lasting results as opposed to ones that go after the cell. Um, you know, all the other gags are actually made inside the cell in, in things like Golgi apparatus uh, and they bond with proteins to make proteoglycans and then they in turn get pushed out into the ECM2 just like hyaluronic acid uh, eventually. Um, going back to HA synthase or HAS, um, the enzyme that makes it, there are three versions. HAS 1, 2, and 3. If you understand the differences on even a basic level, you can figure out what kind of questions to ask a filler or skincare manufacturer when you're deciding what to, what to buy or what to use. <clears throat> HAS 3 is the most active, and it generally makes the lower molecular weight HA, while HAS 1 is the least active because it's making higher molecular weight, and it needs more time to string together each of those individual strands, so higher weight, more time. What we've, what, you know, we found hyaluronin to generally go up to around 8,000 kilodaltons or, or 8 megadaltons, you know, which is a measure of weight. Um, this is much more than other molecules of a similar nature. And e each monomer unit isn't joined from left to right, like, like soldiers all lined up in an exact straight line. It's like joining each, each monomer from, say, east side to west side and building outwards in a perfect line. They're actually linked from the east side to around the southwest side. This is what we call a beta one 
three glycosidic bond. Joining from east to west um, is, is a beta one four glycosidic bond. The carbon that we label as number one is in the east position and the carbon that's perfectly west is in the four position. I'll try and put it on the screen here for you. Um, the one just south of west is labeled carbon three. Hence, we call them one three or one four glycoside bonds or glycosidic bonds, depending on, on which is being used for that chain creation or, or, or that polymer creation. And we can confirm that 1,3 bonding leads to a helix instead of a straight line, because we can use the scattering of light to show us molecular structures. Um, this was done, I, I think, in probably about 1955 for, for hyaluronic acid, um, where we saw its helical shape the first time, and we've known it ever since. Another myth that uh, I, I should probably dispel now is that the idea that HA can hold a thousand times its weight in water. Now, if that were clinically true in the way that every doctor seems to teach it, why is it that after a mil of lip filler, one mil of lip filler, the patient's head doesn't weigh a kilogram more? Here's what really happens. In conditions with a pH of around seven, the carboxylic groups of hyaluronic acid are dissociated, just like sodium and chloride in water dissociating. And the polymer molecules have high density negative charges now. They then attract you know, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, these, and, and other sort of osmotically active cations or positive metal ions. Um, a, a cation is, is just a positively charged metallic ion. Now, because of that, HA can bind up to a thousand times more water than the weight of the macromolecule itself. Doesn't mean it's going to, or that it's even realistic, or that it's even relevant to the use of HA in dermal fillers. But due to these physico-chemical properties, the HA molecule adopts an enlarged conformation, i.e. it occupies an extremely large volume relative to its mass and forms gels even at very low concentrations. So depending on its manufacturing to form these polymers, that's why some fillers pick up more swelling than others and expand more over time to look more puffy than others. So do with how the polymer design has been done which you know, in turn creates regions of electronegativity that attract the positive hydrogen ends of water molecules and cations for localized electrical neutrality. If you look at something like Thixafix technology, for instance, which I'll, I will come to in, in, in more detail later, when you choose that process for dermal filler manufacturing, you get significantly less swelling in your patients. And the result you see on the day isn't gonna double in size two weeks later for you to then correct a review. Because on the day, you have no idea how much water it's gonna attract after the patient leaves the clinic. So depending on, on the concentration and the weight of HA that you use, this in turn then creates a gel of a certain kind, which can control cells, uh, tissue, and, and, and organ activity as well as preventing things like higher weight toxins from invading the cell. Now this has two consequences. Number one, it allows us to understand what's going on with HA in our system. And number two, it allows us to see that filler choice plays a big role in helping or hindering our skin's function, even in a basic level. A HA polymer gel that's in our skin, right? It helps resist compression forces whilst collagen resists extension forces. This is why they both need to, to be addressed if you're trying to rejuvenate skin. So the, the cells that you know, have evolved to perform at their best when there's a specific ratio between the two. People that think, oh, let's add hyaluronic acid and just ignore collagen. Morons. Let's look at uh, very, very specific ways that HA can influence organ function with, with a direct implication on, on skin boosters and thermal fillers. If you understand this, then you'll understand how many companies take shortcuts and make pretty shoddy products. So once the ECM is produced in a specific tissue, it helps cells in that tissue stay differentiated. Let's take chondrocytes as an example. These are cells that produce cartilage, which is type two collagen. Now, if the cells stay in that ideal medium, in that environment, 
then their differentiated state of being a chondrocyte lasts for several generations of the cell division cycle. However, if we experimentally change that medium, then the number of cells that remain differentiated and producing type 2 collagen starts to decrease. They actually start to produce type 1 instead, which is what's produced by fibroblasts. Now, these two proteins are made by two different genes, actually. So what we can say is that the reprogramming of the genome is possible by changing the extracellular matrix around the cell. For example, fibroblasts make a lot of hyaluronic acid, whereas chondrocytes make a lot less. They make cartilage matrix instead. But if we add free hyaluronin to the ECM of chondrocytes, we actually suppress the production of cartilage matrix all of a sudden. And we can so easily and, and really safely say that ECM components act as feedback systems for cell function and genome regulation. So when you look at things like skin boosters, realize that to create mainly type 1 or type 3 collagen is not that difficult. And it can be done even if your product isn't that great. To be able to claim that you've got a breakthrough which specifically creates certain collagens like say type 4, type 7, is a telltale sign that the company has made a genuinely extraordinary product. And we know that for sure now because we see the exact mechanism by how the cell secretion works and how selective it is to do certain jobs. But how exactly does HA influence the genome though? Because remember, HA is made by Has that sits just inside the cell membrane and directly pushes the polymer through the membrane and into the ECM outside. So therefore, there's no direct contact between HA and chromosomes. Well, our, our current best guess is that these changes come about by interactions between the HA and the ECM and transmembrane proteins that then in turn connect into our internal cell cytoskeleton. One of the most important receptors in this regard, and in, in HA world in general, is CD44. And different weights of HA that interact with it give different results. So if you don't ask your sales rep what the HA molecular weight is in the product, they could be pulling the wool over your eyes and, and selling you something that's a complete waste of time. So to summarize, when, when cells proliferate and differentiate into different cell types, these differentiated states are, as a, as a rough rule, quite stable. But some cell types are subjected to limited reversible changes, or so-called modulation. And that's a technical term, by the way. For example, chondrocytes can be converted into fibroblasts under non-optimal conditions and then return to the initial state as optimum conditions become available again. This shows us that if you create a product that isn't great, probably just going to make type 1 or 3 collagen with very little of any other useful type. As well as that, small reversible changes in the differentiated state of cells are also possible in, in many other cell types, and not just chondrocytes, actually. Um, the type of ECM, extracellular matrix, that's synthesized by cells, along with high, high molecular weight HA, can actually help to maintain the differentiated state of adult organism cells. However, preservation of the differentiated cells in that state, in, in the majority of tissues of vertebrates, is based not on their longevity, but it occurs through replacement of the old cells by the new ones. And in order to accomplish good preservation, the differentiated cells should undergo the, you know, the occasional cellular cycle of, of division and, and proliferation. And these processes also form the basis of physiological regeneration and, and, and recovery of, of tissues and organs after damage. Because during damage, to the, during damage the, the ECM is obviously going to be different from things like uh, trauma. 
Uh, as a side note, by the way, you should now understand how microneedling works. When you, when you traumatize the skin with needles, you're creating a sequence of cellular changes, or as we can now call them, mod modulations. Then when they've recovered from all that, they go back to normal because the ECM has now been normalized again. That's the thing that you're actually changing by, by doing microneedling, um, electrical discharge and, and, and things like that. Have a think about uh, mesotherapy now too. Is it any wonder that there's no long-term physiological improvement with, with mesotherapy? You're creating a temporary change by injecting substrates, um, but then when they're used up, the skin just goes back to exactly how it was before because the ECM is still the same. Whereas when you look at uh, products like Sunacos, the changes are so intense, they're super quick, and they last much longer than other skin quality injectables too. And that's specifically because it goes after the ECM and nothing else. There's no substrate in it, like vitamins. Is it any wonder that it can specifically make collagen four and seven maximally when nothing else can? <clears throat> wake up and, and read between the lines. Most skin injectables are all as average as each other. At best, they mostly create type one collagen. Um, let's look at how, how other treatments can, can create changes in our skin too. Um, by using HA changes um, that are produced as, as a result of those particular treatment modalities. Now we have a number of activators and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In inhibitors of cellular proliferation. Uh, we've known about these for a while. Um, differentiated cells preserve mitosis, uh, which is cell division, technical term, um, capability in the tissue where they are for a long time, when, when there's no stem cell reserve. And when the reproduction is the only source of cell mass increase um, you know, examples include heart myocytes, uh, liver cells, uh, hepatocytes, endothelial cells of the blood vessels, so on and so on. Skin is kind of the, the opposite because th there is a stem cell reserve in, in the form of keratinocytes. They're a type of stem cell. And, and one of the best ways to investigate the mechanism of transition of, of uh, differentiated cells into proliferative ones is to look at liver cells or, or hepatocytes in adults. Uh, this is fascinating, by the way, you know, because the, the population of hepatocytes is functionally homogenous. So they're all the same. And all hepatocytes perform one and the same uh, spectrum of functions, shall we say. So in other words, they're all basically twins of each other. So under normal conditions, hepatocytes renew themselves at, at quite a, a low, um, but, it, but, but also a very controlled rate. Um, that is, you know, through physiological regeneration. But fascinatingly, through experimentation, we've discovered that if you remove two thirds of a liver from an animal, the remainder of the hepatocyte population enters the cell, the, the cellular cycle, and, and it regenerates the initial size of the organ. I, I, I was, I think I was about 13 when I read that, and I, I couldn't believe it, I was fascinated. I still remember it to this day, uh, you know, and, and besides the, the surgical removal of the liver though, the, the proliferation of the hepatocytes can also be induced by ultrasound, you know, short-term heating, uh, mechanical damages, changing ionic mediums, and, and, and much, much more. These methods essentially disrupt or destroy hyaluronin, proteoglycans, and, and other things that you find, the structures in the ECM. And it's possible that these destructive processes act as a trigger for prompting the differentiated cells to enter the cellular cycle and divide. Uh, we do know that the enhancement of, of hyaluronin synthesis and, and, and secretion, followed by its transport back into the cell and nucleus via endocytosis, are some of the, the first responses to stimuli like uh, the ones I've just mentioned. When we stimulate cells to divide in this way, we're actually accelerating degradation of, of both extracellular and endosomal, i.e. intracellular hyaluronin. In other words, turnover of hyaluronin is accelerated. So the ultrasound treatments that people sell basically have no physiological improvement at all. You're destroying just as much as you're creating. And even if it gives some kind of decent tightening effect, how significant a lift is it really? And how long 
is it genuinely going to last once the ECM normalizes again? I hope you're starting to see how to create long-lasting significant change in the skin. You know, are you starting to see that home skin care can actually give more of a result than mesotherapy? Uh, but anyway, uh, in, enough with the rhetorical questions. Let's take a look at some uh, so we say examples of, of how hyaluronin can be implicated in bad stuff too, uh, both in, in preventing it and also making things worse. As I'm sure you can guess, unfavorable chemical and physical factors can lead to undesired mutations. Take uh, UV radiation causing skin cancer. That's an obvious and, and relevant example. Um, each gene during the life of, of an individual, uh, individual homo sapien can undergo mutations approximately, I think it was like 10 billion times. So dividing differentiated cells, they face numerous uh, options, shall we, so we say. So number one, they can finish the cellular cycle normally and pass into the initial differentiated state again. Uh, number two, they can pass into the new steady state of the differentiated cell. Number three, they can adopt an immortalized state. That is, the cell just constantly divides. Um, and, and, and number four, turn into cancer cells. Now, when the regulatory systems are seriously damaged though, technically we actually have two further options. Number five is, is apoptosis, which is controlled cell death, or shall we say controlled cytolysis. Um, and number six is uncontrolled cytolysis. And these, these last two options will lead to cell death, like either way, it doesn't really matter which way you go. And, and controlled cell death, which is apoptosis, is actually very important and, and something we want to preserve. I know that doesn't make sense, but it's used in the final stages of wound healing, as an example. It, it regulates the, the, the replacement of the temporary granulation tissue uh, by the final scar tissue. Now, several types of cells, for example, say fibroblasts, um, endothelial cells, myofibroblasts, uh, inflammatory cells, they all undergo apoptosis. And it is very well regulated. We need it. We can't, we can't survive without it. And when apoptosis is slowed down or stopped, the fibroblasts continue to proliferate, creating keloid tissue or keloid scars. And, and, and this process involves genes of early response, that is the P53. Uh, and the P53 gene controls the normal cellular cycle and, and the return of cells back into their differentiated state. If you have a mutation in this gene, then it can cause the development of tumors in, in humans. Like a, a single point mutation in P53 is actually also found in, in fibroblasts of keloid scars. So we know they're highly linked. And in the normal skin fibroblast of the same subjects, the mutations aren't present. Um, so therefore, the entire organism, like, like say a whole human being, for instance, is maintained by two opposite processes, cell proliferation and apoptosis. Um, HA has functions in, in both of these processes. You know, be, being localized in the um, intercellular matrix, HA is forced to, uh, to kind of just get on with it, uh, like accept its fate, if you like, uh, coming from the, the, the sort of mutagenic influence of external physical and chemical factors, as well as internal factors too. In particular, uh, free radicals, I'm sure we've all heard of them, they're very frequent when we consider sunlight hitting our skin all the time. And as a result of this, HA hey, and other macromolecules, they reduce the mutagenic background and frequency of mutations, and therefore they decrease the probability of dif different diseases. This is why it's important to have HA hey, in our skin. It acts as a shield to prevent damage, like another version of uh, sun cream, if you like. It takes the hit from the sun so that, so that everyone else doesn't have to. And if you contrast the benefits uh, of hyaluronic acid though, it can actually increase pathology development. Mutant cancer cells, as an example, can have a selective advantage over normal cells. They're capable of replicating limitlessly while ignoring something called the Hayflick limit. And, and they penetrate into the intercellular kind of space of, of spaces of normal cells. In other words, they can grow invasively and uncontrollably and, and spread metastatically. Well, metastasis is spread. Um, and, and the ECM of cancer is so rich in hyaluronic acid and hyaluronidase enzymes that seem to be implicated 
in metastatic spread. Now, on one hand, tumor cells use hyaluronidase as a molecular assassin, causing depolymerization of HA, so that the subsequent degradation products can help facilitate the propagation of a tumor by causing angiogenesis. In other words, formation of blood vessels into the tumor so that the tumor can grow. On the other hand, the high molecular weight HA in the ECM prevents replication, migration, and, and, and metastatic spread of cells. And it even strengthens the activity of anti-cancerous factors that we have. On top of that, different cell types are densely, densely encapsulated by strong connective tissue. And, and their ECM contains significant amounts of hyaluronic acid too. Some of these cells will, will perish, some of these cell types will perish, um, and they're deprived of specific survival factors when they cross the connective tissue barrier. So epithelial cells, for example, are immobilized because of adhesion and anchoring to the, the basal lamina, um, just an evolutionary adaptation. Aside from collagen of different types, such as say four and, and uh, 17, the basal lamina in skin contains hyaluronic acid too. Only certain specialized cells like macrophages, lymphocytes, and, and the, the branches of neurons called dendrites can cross this barrier under normal conditions. So HA, as a result of this, isn't limited to participation in adhesion and, and, and cell and tissue compartmentalization. It's also involved in the regulation of the cellular replication versus apoptosis equilibrium using uh, signaling systems. Our regulation systems in, in superior higher class vertebrates like say ourselves homo sapiens are super super stable uh, and this allows our cells to search for the most optimum and, and stable states even while undergoing a, a change in external conditions and that if you think about it is, is homeostasis that's a form of homeostasis. The role that hyaluronin plays in the creation of optimum stable states and also in, in pathologies associated with disturbances in, in the signaling systems and, and the synthesis of HA and other glycosaminoglycans, that allows you to understand why some moisturizers that have HA in them actually lead to drier skin rather than more hydration. Bloody road works. Hope you can't hear that. In every one of our cells, right, the, the, the normal physiological level of, of a substance's concentration is created and maintained by the, the same type of equilibrium, right? You've got synthesis and, and decomposition. This is, this is just a, a, a general biological rule in all of nature, and it also applies to hyaluronic acid, as you'd probably expect. So to answer how it happens for hyaluronic acid, we can look um, at its metabolism through the perspective of um, ha the synthesis and decomposition in terms of like how it actually happens. And it's crucial to do it because it has such a variety of, of physiological and functional uh, abilities and capabilities, despite having such a really simple chemical structure that, as I said, undergoes no modification post-synthesis, as, as we've already learned now. And we can do this by asking about how the physicochemical properties are changed in relation to um, why the Has enzyme genes are needed for HA of, of different weights. In general, it has a, a different rate of production and breakdown in different tissues. I'm sure you probably could have guessed that anyway. Um, for example, in the skin, the half-life is about one to two days. Um, so what that means is that over this, this, that time period, half of it decomposes and, and the same amount is made at the same time. How long are those roadworks going to go on for? So, um, what was I? Yeah. So, so those of you that think you can just shove infinite amounts of HA into the skin for an infinite benefit, thinking that that can genuinely lead to a sustained change, apparently seem to have no idea that the body will auto-correct that imbalance. Because if the balance isn't right, then your cellular cycles and differentiation pathways are royally screwed. And guess what? There's no way on earth that you're gonna change that, ever. But what you can do is understand that and pick products that work with that concept instead of being oblivious to it uh, you know, in your own little 
fantasy world. Because, you know, the, the production of HA is, is mainly regulated by Hass enzymes. And, that, and, and they can be controlled at, at different levels from, say, the epigenetic level to other types of modifications, which are even well beyond the scope of this video. Um, comment below if you want me to go into that. I'm sure no one will. Um, the biosynthesis is it's an energy-consuming process. And so along with HA uh, breakdown, it's strongly connected to the maintenance of metabolic homeostasis in general. You see, through the, through the interaction between HAS and sugars like um, uridine diphosphate N-acetylglucosamine, we can stabilize HAS in the membrane and then increase HA production. Conversely, HAS can be phosphorylated by AMP-activated protein kinase, AMPK, which is a, this master metabolic regulator. It's activated by low ATP-AMP ratios, which inhibits HA secretion. Now that's complex, but in other words, low ATP levels or energy levels in the cells can switch off HA production. ATP, remember, is, is, is the universal energy currency of all cells, and without it, we, we would literally die. You're seeing now that there's, there's only one pathway to increase its production, and one to stop it as well. And on top of that, as, as, um, and as something interesting from the viewpoint of regenerative medicine or functional medicine, whatever you want to call it, has expression and the deposition of HA into the ECM are inhibited by sirtuin 1, SIRT1, S-I-R-T-1, um, which is another important energetic sensor, which confirms the tight connection between nutrient availability and HA metabolism. Sirtuin 1 belongs to a family of enzymes called sirtuins, uh, and these have been heavily implicated in, in longevity and aging. Again, it's, it's beyond the scope of this video, but the activity of these enzymes is the point of using supplements like NAD Plus to live longer. Uh, I'm, I've made a video uh, about that on this channel if you'd like to watch and, and learn how to you know, potentially live longer and, and, and with, with no disease and things, and, and for mental clarity, etc., etc. Um, the connection between hyaluronic acid and the, and the energy currency of our cells, ATP, is why you can actually get just as good, if not better, hyaluronic acid treatments in the skin without actually injecting anything. And instead, simply just using something like 633 nanometer red light at very high energies from, you know, like a Dermalux LED, because you're going to be creating exceptional amounts of ATP with that wavelength, which then tilts the intracellular ATP AMP ratios and triggers the Has enzyme family to auto create the perfect hyaluronic acid weights and ratios all by themselves. And if you don't know the Sorry, I've gone a bit long without explaining it, but if you don't know the difference between ATP and AMP, ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and AMP is an adenosine monophosphate. Um, so once energy is used, it goes from tri to, to, to mono because the usage of energy often translates in chemistry language to phosphorylation, or in other words, the donation of a phosphate group to something else. So you have three phosphates, you're a, you're a triphosphate, and if as a triphosphate you then donate uh, the two of those, you can go down to only having one, which makes you a monophosphate. Now, the rate control of the Has enzyme activity, which in turn controls the ECMHA composition, is done with either interaction with, with something like um, a polysaccharide, or, as we've now learned, interaction with things that can phosphorylate and, and, and dephosphorylate it from the inside of the cell, like protein kinases which in turn can be controlled by energy molecules like ATP and a AMP, depending on the phosphorylation level. Has two, which can make um, roughly up to, I think around 2000 kilodaltons or two megadaltons um, of HA, is that's active during the transformation of the differentiated cell into the cell cycle. In other words, it's active when a differentiated cell is going about its general cell division cycle. Has three, on the other hand, which makes the, the lower weight HA, is active during differentiation and suppressed during cell cycles. Has one, as far as I'm aware, doesn't seem to play any role in, in this specific activity. 
um, and, and instead it just seems to kind of preserve the differentiated state, as we've touched on briefly before. So such a, a, an adjustable system of gene activity on the transcription, translation, um, and, and synthesis levels at different rates and different values of, of molecular weights should clearly indicate to you that hyaluronin plays a key role in selecting and determining the status of the cell and its adaptation properties. So when companies don't reveal the weights that they use in, in, in skincare and, and injectables and anything else, in my opinion, it's a complete admission of something to hide. You don't just select any weight that you like based on price. You, you select what kind of cellular product you'd like to make or cellular change you'd like to create. And the weight is then determined automatically based on our understanding of HA and cell interactions. Now, as, as we've spoken about already, high HA amounts can trigger um, hyaluronic acid activity to recreate a balance, to, to trim the hair when it's growing too long, if you like. Uh, and remember that for all of you who, who think just injecting hyaluronic acid again and again is gonna miraculously create the most amazing skin ever. It's physically impossible for unlimited amounts of HA to be sitting in the skin. And it can actually be quite unhealthy because it limits so many things that, that make up homeostasis that I'm about to go through now. And that's why, you know, for, for safety reasons, the body has to break down an excess if it's present. As a quick example, the more HA there is, the more difficult it can be for signaling molecules to access receptors. There's much, much more than that. Um, and I, I will explain in more detail, but just remember that concept for now. Um, as hyaluronidases go, we know of, I think, probably about seven different ones in the body currently. Um, and their synthesis is controlled by certain genes and their activity is regulated by things like hormones as well. I'll, I'll put a little diagram up on the screen here or something um, just to show how a different thing can, can activate and inhibit the, the degradation enzyme. Um, hormones, uh, inflammation, and even certain amino acids can actually trigger it. You, I, guess, I guess now that you know that, you, you, you kind of have to wake up and, and realize that, that fillers, which can cause more inflammation, don't just go down when you see the patient two weeks later because swelling settles but also because the inflammation they create can trigger more hyalase activity too. They're literally causing their own downfall. It, it's not just swelling you need to worry about, it, it's genuine inflammation. Uh, and, and the consequences of this in terms of the body's response to the biopolymer that we've just injected. This is, this is, this is also why the idiots that walk around saying, the more inflammation you create during microneedling, the better the result. They haven't got a clue what they're talking about. If more inflammation was better, why don't you just do continuous microneedling for six hours? There's such a thing as too little stimulation and too much stimulation when it comes to things like needling. And understanding triggers of hyaluronides is one perspective that allows you to see that. Too much needling literally causes your HA degradation enzyme to activate more. Now, in order to understand, God, I've just seen how bad my haircut looks on the screen. I shouldn't have got it that short. Um, now, it, yeah, as I was saying, so in, in order to kind of understand it a bit more, the, the issues with high laser activity um, and, and the different weights that you can have, I'm, I'm gonna show you what happens very specifically when we either purposely cause degradation with things like filler reversal, and also what happens outside of clinician control. I cannot express how important this is to understand, at least conceptually, if not in, in deep detail, because there's so many things that people talk about which happen during or after dissolving. And I see clinicians say they don't know why that happened. It's because there are specific mechanisms behind it that have specific outcomes. For example, if you take CD44, right? This is, this is the main receptor um, that I, I'm sure I think I mentioned earlier. 
different weights of HA that interact with it yield different responses from our cells. It's one of the most important things to learn when it comes to HA, because it lets you see why not paying attention to which HA product you're injecting and, and, and even topically applying can go hand in hand with being disappointed in, in not getting perfect or, or desired results. How many times have you tried a skin booster and been underwhelmed? I know I certainly was quite a long time, but before I tried Cynicos. Um, or maybe the same skin booster gave you a good result in one person, but not in someone else. I'm sure we've all had that at least. Okay, take this as an example, right? If we look at something like 1200 kilodalton HA, that actually leads to fibroblast proliferation in humans. Now, there is a, a, a certain skin booster, which I won't name because they can be very annoying. Um, this particular skin booster is very, very popular and is probably the first one you think of. Uh, it's injected in two sessions in five points on the face. Now, as you'll come to see in this lecture, it's a complete load of rubbish in my opinion and even the company themselves can't say on their own website what they need to prove that they're the best, in my opinion. I mentioned this product because it uses two types of HA together. And one of them is 1200 kilodaltons. Now the combination of the high and the low weight in the same place makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, as, as you'll learn beyond all reasonable doubt in, in this video. If you compare that product to what I would say is easily the best skin quality injectable in the world, Sunacos, that also uses 1200 kilodaltons. Now these, these rival products, they, they are rivals remember, but the, even as rivals, they still 100% agree on the type of hyaluronic acid weight to use to stimulate fibroblasts. Interestingly, Sunacos separates the high and low weight into sort of different areas and products as would make sense from the perspective of anyone that knows how HA receptors work, frankly. Only one HA chain can interact with one receptor at one time. Doesn't take a genius to work it out. You can't put three keys in the same lock at the same time. It's one key in one lock at one time. And now that you know about these two products, the way they use the HA and, 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 and combine or don't combine it with other things, shows how good they are. One makes mainly type one and three collagen, just like everything else in the market. And Sunacos states explicitly that it can make physiologically the most amount of type four and seven of all products in the market. So first product was amazing. Why don't they claim to make the most amount of four and seven as well? Clearly they'd be lying. So they haven't said anything. Now, Let's look at the um, effect that volume has on cell activity too. Because uh, I, that, I think that's also quite important, or well, for me it is anyway. Um, in rat studies, we can see that HA in, in the sort of 400 to 1000 kilodalton range suppresses endothelial cell proliferation, but more than 1000 inhibits fibroblasts and synovial cells. However, when they use less than one milligram per mil, the same weight stimulated proliferation of both types of cells. This, rewind that if that doesn't make sense. This kind of result is easy to observe across many studies. And it can be attributed to many things like different concentrations related to impurities like other glycosaminoglycans, GAGs, and, and, and receptor differences in expression and, and the amount of the receptors and, and their actual sensitivity to HA as well. And, and when these HAs get broken down by hyaluronidase though, it's not just a case of injecting it and saying goodbye to your patient, see you later. It's, it's not just a case of using hyalase and, and, and saying your fill is dissolving, so now I'll see you in two weeks to refill. For example, if you look at cases where citra filler has been dissolved, um, some patients look absolutely horrendous after. And that's not just because the area is kind of deflated now with, with the filler gone, it's because as, as we know now, HA is a signaling molecule. And certain weights can give certain signals. And if you add hyalase, you create degradation products. These products are important to understand as well as, as, as the actual original polymer. And it explains why certain treatments cause such bad results. 
the, the smaller fragments that we create by, by breaking down the parent polymer, um, that they're triggering processes and they're having biological implications. It's not that the filler disappears by magic. There's, there's a whole lot more going on when we do that because of the unique nature of HA, not just intact, but in pieces. As an example, fragments of biopolymers, um, as well as their parent intact polymers, both have functions. And it's one reason hyaluronin has so many functions, because even when you destroy it all, all you end up doing is, is breaking one piece of Lego into smaller pieces, and all the smaller pieces still have function, albeit different to the big piece. Um, and, and just so you know, by the way, this isn't just for HA either, even collagen does the same thing. That's why there's a limit as to how much collagen can actually exist in one place. People who think, oh, let's put more and more and more and more collagen, that just doesn't work. Go read a book. Um, now, let's talk about something called intermediate fragments in the context of something called transition structures, both, both technical terms. I've already spoken about the extracellular matrix and the intracellular matrix, but I'm going to introduce something to you called the inter cellular matrix. If you're watching this and English isn't your first language, by the way, I'll get them written on screen so you can see the slight spelling and, and pronunciation difference. The intercellular matrix is, it's the, it's the zone um, where we have kind of self-assembling macromolecules, like, like collagen as an example, and, and they're pushed out from the cell to complete the formation. So they're mainly made inside and then they're, they're put together finally in the packaging outside. This is why just mindlessly injecting collagen inducing products into people's skin sometimes gives no result. If the ECM quality is poor because the patient has really poor skin in general, then the intercellular matrix is probably going to be poor too, which means you're trying to build a car in a factory that's falling apart around it. Clearly the, 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 the car is probably going to be made with all sorts of dents and defects as things fall on top of it as you're trying to make it. Now, we've, we've spoken at length about how the, the, the extracellular matrix controls the selectivity and, and uh, adaptation. We also mentioned that the breakdown of ECM components into smaller pieces has an effect too, because the smaller pieces have function and not just a big piece. But what about during the process of breakdown, when you're in that in-between phase? So you've not got a big piece, you know, got lots of small pieces, you're, you're in that process, you're going from one to the other. Think about it this way. Um, let's, um, it, so a football manager can teach the, the players how to play when they have the ball, and also when they're defending and the other team has the ball, so when they don't have the ball. But what about during the transition between those two phases, when you're winning the ball back or you're losing it? And, and this is something that happens in the skin too. When we break down hyaluronic acid and other glycosaminoglycans and, and proteins by their corresponding degradation enzyme, what we end up doing is, is making this temporary matrix. It's based on intermediate fragments. And this temp matrix is also capable of signal transfer. Think about that really hard, just for a second. The ideal ECM has signaling capability. The decomposed ECM has the same capability and the intermediate phase between them also has it. If we translate that to clinical language, that means that anything we do has signaling activity. Are you surprised now as to why things like dissolving filler gives changes to the tissues around the filler too and not just the filler itself? Are you surprised why certain moisturizers with crap quality hyaluronic acid actually give your patients or yourself dry skin instead of hydrated skin? Are you surprised why some patients don't respond to skin boosters the way you like them to? In fact, you know what? The concept of skin boosting is total nonsense. It's just temporary feelings of plumpness. It doesn't actually improve the, the physiological processes and, and, and directing of tissue activity. That's why I use Sunacos. That's why I'll never use a moisturizer. And yet I still have, I, I still never have dry skin. Surprise, surprise. Uh, I'm gonna go off on a, on a rant here, so I'll get back on topic. What was I talking about? Temporary matrix. So temporary matrix can signal the cell into a temporary or stationary state. 
um, and, and what happens during this fractional parent biopolymer degradation is we end up creating this, this multi-level, three-dimensional structures of the ECM up to a liquid crystalline structure. All the decomposition products create this new gooey thing where the original ECM was. Um, but oh, I should probably explain liquid crystals. Liquid crystals, um, for those of you that don't know, they're, they're like, they're, it's a state of matter. Uh, it's somewhere between liquids and solid crystals. So essentially, uh, it, it's something that can kind of flow a bit like a liquid, um, but the molecular structure is, is still quite geometrically organized, like a traditional solid or a crystal. Uh, there's really kind of specific properties, and, and when you turn them into a solid, like um, aramid, you end up with the, the bulletproof stuff, what's it called, Kevlar. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of that as, as the armor that people wear inside their vests. Um, you can make liquid crystal polymers by dissolving the parent biopolymers in a liquid or heating them up past their melting transition point. You've, you've used these in your life many times, even if you haven't realized, um, and are not even just bulletproof vests. Um, if you've ever watched an LCD TV, you've taken advantage of this. LCD in, in a TV context stands for liquid crystal display. <clears throat> so to describe uh, the, the formation of this liquid crystalline phase, I think will be, it's it's quite difficult to imagine. Um, I'll probably just get a picture and put it on screen now that, that explains it quite well. Um, pause if you need to and, and, and study the picture because this is essentially what you're creating in your patients whenever you use things like hyalase to dissolve filler. And if you use terrible filler, this LC matrix is, is gonna cause problems for you and your patient. Now all the while, well, you're, you're watching this, by the way. I hope you're, I hope you're slowly coming to the realization that fillers are not all the same, and, and that's only said by people that know almost nothing about hyaluronic acid. If you want to skip the rest of this video and just find out which filler is the best because you're impatient, then you know, email Prolenium, ask your local Revenus reps details. Mine's um, Sinead, who covers London probably fed up with me now, but if you're also in London, then get in touch with her um, to see the products and, and I'm sure she'll, she'll help you out. But, you know, getting back on topic, um, sorry, it's it's the correct time now to move from the formation of, of temporary 3D structures in an LC matrix to the natural organization of HA in a traditional ECM. So once it's recovered from a temporary matrix, shall we say, after some kind of stimulation, um, it, it, it can kind of organize itself into different 3D structures and experiments that we've done have, have shown that it can form lots of different shapes, you know, um, like a helix shape. Uh, that's, and and these, these are based on its size, types of ions that are present in the medium, the amount of water around it. Um, and in water-based solutions specifically, it takes on a, a specific structure we call hydrogen bonds between the chains. And these bonds can hold things together, but they're not super, super strong. Think of it like, say, Velcro. Um, you can use it to keep things together, but you can also pull it off into a different position if needed. In fact, there's hydrogen bonds between like each half of the DNA, which keeps the DNA together. But when we want to separate it, like um, during the reading of genes, it can be, be, be split or separated without too much effort using enzymes like DNA helicase. And when we look at historic, um, again, light scattering studies, which I think I mentioned earlier, we can learn that the HA molecule acts like a, a loosely packed chain with a, with a bend radius, I think, of around 200 nanometers. The stiffness and the packing of the chain, these things are influenced by the internal hydrogen bonds that I've just described. So essentially hyaluronic acid can be visualized in your mind as a highly hydrated and kind of tangled sphere. In water, HA's viscosity, in other words, the, the resistance to flow or how thick it is in layman's terms, peaks when it's in the most stretched out or extended form. But as the concentration of HA in a water solution goes up, the viscosity also goes up very quickly because of the weaving together of chains.
and it, and it forms a, a three-dimensional network and it creates this, if we zoom out, a kind of gel-like structure. And if you add salts to water solutions, it significantly reduces their viscosity too. And this is why higher concentrations of HA are found in fillers that mimic bone when compared to ones which mimic, say, soft tissue. And the more HA polymers you put in, the more tangled it becomes. And you, you can think of it like, like I said before, that, that hair in the drain analogy. Single hairs, they just flow like water when there's very little of them. But when there's lots of hair, all the strands naturally tangle with each other and they, they don't flow, they become this ball or this mass that clumps and acts like a ball instead of a running liquid like water. And then obviously you get your blockage and the plumb around. Viscosity of fillers increases because there are more hydrogen bonds holding everything together when you add more chains. That's the basis of it. At the end of the day, HA is, is very water attracting, i.e. hydrophilic. Um, and, and a physiological pH, which is around 7 to, to 7.4 or 7.36, I think, um, each HA unit has this, this carboxyl group and it becomes negatively charged because it loses a hydrogen in solution and this makes the molecule negatively charged in this location. The, and this particular feature allows hyaluronic acid to bind with various positive metal ions that I've mentioned before, cations like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, whatever, because of its hydrated shell. And if you don't know, a hydration shell is basically where a number of water molecules surround a specific ion, like calcium as an example, and they surround it basically on all the sides where the positive metal ion is surrounded by all the negative ends of the water molecules surrounding it, like a magnet north attracting south. And this is the exact reason Hitre attracts water. It's to do with hydrate shells of metal ions that in turn are attracted to a negative section of hyaluronic acid where a positive hydrogen has been lost. And as a result of the water attraction, like I mentioned earlier, the volume of the HA molecule can expand by a thousand times, forming weakly packed hydrated matrices. Now I'm sure you've all heard that the line, like I mentioned earlier, about you know attracting a thousand times this way, blah blah blah. Hopefully you understand now how that actually works and, and, and you get it in, in more detail. It's actually metal that is attracted and, and, and they create a hydrated shell. Um, frankly, Chemists and scientists all around the world are laughing at doctors that walk around talking about attracting a thousand times its weight in water. The truth is, like I said, the hydrate shell, which is where the water is, is actually dependent on several factors, like the charge of the metal ion that gets attracted, um, the, the geometric alignment and spatial dimensions of, of that hydrate shell formation process. Watch this section again if you need to, so you can please understand this and tell speakers at conferences to stop talking fallacies while trying to sound intelligent because they just look like they just look you know terrible to those that actually know what they're talking about in, in this context now before i go off on another rant uh, i'm sure there'll be many more in this video um, i'll tell you how living biological systems use polysaccharide properties too and and not just thermal fillers you see our cells rely on properties that these polymers create as a necessary consequence of their existence, such as elasticity, viscosity, rheological properties like, like volume and, and, and lubrication, um, osmotic pressure to maintain homeostasis, diffusion barriers to affect the rate of, of diffusion of molecules on their journey to or from the cell, uh, flow resistance to prevent fluid loss or, or excess uptake, and even something called excluded volume, which is where a three-dimensional network uh, of polymer chains can displace certain molecules from the immediate environment. Now, I'm sure I've missed some there, but um, even if I have, you can, uh, you can now at least kind of see how, um, what's the word, crucial it is to create such a specific balance to get the optimum result from our cells. And this is why different products, such as skin boosters, that try to achieve the same goal, get different results. They have different abilities and how good they are at matching the correct conditions that the cells need. And this balance is only one. It's been selected from millions of years of evolution. What that means for clinicians, if you are one that's watching, what that means for you, 
is that there can't be more than one best product at making the perfect ECM unless the products are literally 100% identical. And that's why, and I'm sorry for going on about this, but that's why there's no other products that can make the same outcome as Sunacos in the skin. The patent that it has is literally on this specific balance to create the perfect environment in the extracellular matrix. Even the shapes that hyaluronic acid makes have to be a certain way. It can exist both in the ECM and on the cell surface in a very large number of conformational states like elongated chains, helices, loose spirals, clips, condensed rods. And when, when the chains interact, then they can form fibrils, webs, uh, piles, all, all sorts of uh, random shapes. Well, they're not random technically, um, but, but their sizes can be quite random, just like their perimeter length. Um, and on average, their weight might be around, you know, let's say around 1,000 kilodaltons or one megadaltons, uh, one megadalton, I should say. And when they're all lined up, you get these secondary hydrogen bonds, specifically in the direction of the polymer's axis. And this helps us give stability and it creates hydrophobic domains which face away from the surrounding water. And this in turn then creates order and structure to the whole polymer. It's the same as like, you know, protein structure and why they're self-assembling. You just string the right sequence of amino acids and they naturally attract and repel in certain ways, which leads to the same final 3D product being made every time you have the same base sequence of amino acids. Uh, I find it fascinating, frankly, um, always have. Uh, and depending on how you use it, different properties of the same molecule can do opposite things in the skin. Look at the example I gave earlier, right, of that particular skin booster that I couldn't name and uh, Synacos. Using similar ingredients, but Synacos outperforms the other every time. Um, look, at, look at different fillers. They're all made of hyaluronic acid, but they use different types. So some will give you more swelling, more inflammation, more uh, delayed onset nodules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is why it's so important to understand hyaluronic acid. The variety of physical structures that it can exist in, known as, again, as like I said, conformational states, depends on things like chain length, surrounding ions, pH of the environment, or acidity of the environment, or alkalinity, the binding to nearby cellular components, etc., etc. And this then forms the massive spectrum that we have of all the physiological, functional, and biological properties of the polymer. In fact, depending on these factors that I've just named, it can literally do opposite functions depending on the size used. For example, low molecular weight can function as an endogenous alarm signal, which can then initiate direct signaling pathways. And we know that low weight binds to CD44 because there's years and years and years of, of scientific publishing to prove it beyond all reasonable doubt now. In fact, all activities and functions of HA can be linked to the, the chain length or the, or the size of the polymer using all the data that we have over however many decades that we've been researching this since 1918. Um, if you know me personally, you'll know that for years and years, I have always said that if you're using HA in any context, whether it be for, for fillers, for, for skin boosters, um, masks or anything else, you need to ask what the size is that you're using. Otherwise, you, you just can't predict the outcome or, or guarantee that undesired outcomes won't come about. This information we're going through now is why I've been saying that. And I hope you're starting to realize the importance of asking about it now to your rep or your, your company, whatever. As an example, right, when you use the lower weights, you're influencing the expression of heat shock proteins. Disaccharides can actually crystallize and, and, and other oligosaccharides can form liquid crystal states, as I've mentioned already, in fact, all molecular, all low molecular weight fragments of all biopolymers, including hyaluronic acid, uh, nucleic acids, proteins, they can all form liquid crystal structures with intermediate states 
that have new functional properties in comparison to their parent biopolymers that they've in turn been made from. Oh, really want a Deliveroo. So if you want to make this easy, here's a sequence that sums up what happens when, when you cleave or chop or degrade biopolymers. Number one, under controlled biopolymer cleavage, you make new oligomers and they're formed with new functional properties. Number two, during that cleavage, um, depolymerization, so turning it from polymer to oligomers monomers or, or shorter polymers, triggers its own cascade mechanisms. Then uh, uh, number three, then after that's done, the new bioactive product, and they will always be bioactive, can have opposite functions to their parents. Then uh, number four, then the new functional properties of the intermediate cleavage products are aimed, i.e. their purpose is to restore the ideal biological system. And that last rule is, is, is what we know as Le Chatelier's principle in biology. If you remember back to GCSE chemistry, I'm sure you, you remember it. It basically states that, that a system that's in a specific set equilibrium, if you take that and then you try and shift it somewhere away from equilibrium, it will then naturally try and shift uh, back to try and revert the change you put in to create the original equilibrium again. Um, for example, all oligomeric fragments of natural parent polymers are involved in cell and tissue regeneration by activating the synthesis of new polymers by creating these temporary matrices we've spoken about. And, and, and this delays cell apoptosis and, and cytolysis um, and also activates cell proliferation. Cells that don't grow in regular conditions can actually do so in, in times of injury. So that the whole system can revert back to the regular conditions where the ideal stationary equilibrium lies, homeostasis. One of the ways that we can do this is by understanding the hyaluron and signaling systems, which cause the entire environment to revert back to what it was. And it's important because if, if you understand that better, you stand a chance at, at fighting disease better. And our cosmetic world make better looking skin as well. We know already that HA can bind to cell receptors. I've explained it at, at length now. Actually, you know what? One thing I haven't mentioned is, is that one part of one HA polymer can bind to one cell, while another part of the same polymer can bind to another cell. And, and what this causes, it's, it's, that's aggregation. Currently, we know of several receptors that are implicated in, in hyaluronin and, and other biopolymers binding cell membranes. They've all got this, this really high affinity to hyaluronic acid, and the two main ones we need to know about in this context, in our context today, are CD44, as I've already mentioned, and RAM. CD44 stands for Cluster of Differentiation 44, and RAM stands for Receptor for Hyaluronin Mediated Motility, R-H-A-M-M. -M. And the products that you inject or you rub um, into your patients are hitting these specific receptors. And, and that is what gives the changes that we see these interactions with these receptors. And, and these membrane receptors have three different sections and each section has its own function. So we'll break it down. If we start with the bit that's on the outside of the cell, touching the extracellular matrix, this is located at the end terminus of the protein, right? Receptors are proteins, remember. You can think of it as meaning the nitrogen end of the protein. It's usually glycosylated um, and it's used to recognize targets that have binding ability. The middle part is the bit that's actually going through the cell membrane. We call this the transmembrane section, obviously. And it makes CD44 a transmembrane receptor. And this section has one or more alpha helix in the protein sequence. An alpha helix, if you don't know, is it's just a, it's a part of a protein and, and it winds up like a spiral. It doesn't mean the whole protein is a spiral, it just means that one bit is kind of kinked up in, in a way that looks like a spiral. And in CD44's case, it's because the, the, the alpha helices, the spiral sections in, in the middle, 
um, that can create a kind of anchorage in the membrane for us. In fact, I'll just get a picture of it on, on, on of CD44's growth structure here on the screen, and you should be able to see it to, to understand it better. Now, after the middle section, clearly we've got the final bit, which faces the internal portion of the cell, so it's touching the inside of the cell. This is the bit that creates a, a chemical signal inside the cell. This portion, or, or domain, if you want to be technical, uh, of the protein, uh, it must translate the binding of a signal molecule on the outside with an appropriate cell response. In other words, it changes the quantity and or activity of internal enzymes as a result of its modification. For example, being uh, phosphorylated or dephosphorylated because something is bound to the outside portion of it. Now the binding of the signal molecule, which is the primary mediator in this case, alters the shape of the receptor. In scientific terminology, its conformational state is altered. I've, I've said it many times now. The alteration then gets transmitted to other macromolecules, either in the membrane or inside the cell, which makes one molecule interact with another. And this process is overall what we then term signal transduction. It's really important to be aware of because cosmetic ingredients are going down this pathway, whether we like it or not. And these signals are either generated directly or with a secondary mediator like cyclic AMP, calcium ions, nitrogen monoxide, etc., etc. Remember that the primary mediator is the signal molecule that started the signal transduction in the first place, like HA. And this cascade then regulates cell response by altering either the activity of the cell and or the amount of enzymes that, that, that are working and or other macromolecules. And it's because of this that there are direct signal pathways from the cell surface into the cytoplasm and nucleus. They can modify gene activity, enzyme synthesis, cell proliferation, apoptosis, migration, uh, differentiation, inflammatory responses, and, and more. I'm sure I've, I've forgotten a few. And all of that is something which HA binding to CT44 plays a role in. Cell motility, though, is influenced by another receptor that I've just mentioned, RAM. Now this allows something called HA endocytosis, where the HA is transported from the ECM into the cell using a process called receptor-mediated endocytosis, or also absorptional endocytosis. What happens is that where the macromolecules bind to the receptor on the outside, we get this cluster where an endocytosis vesicle called, called an endosome forms. It's like, a, it's like a carrier bag, if you like, that the cell makes to bring things inside that have been bagged up. Now, this is actually how several, oh, I've got a bad backache here. I need a bigger chair. This is actually how um, several hormones, including insulin, polypeptides, cholesterol, they all come into the cell. Once these molecules are taken in, then they're put into these bags inside the cell called lysosomes. And once they're inside, it's possible for, for protein and, and polysaccharide signaling molecules and or their, their decomposition products to have function inside the cell as well. Similar to things like steroids um, and, and uh, like thyroid hormones too. One of the reasons it can be involved in this is the fact that the RAM receptor isn't just localized on the surface of the cell membrane. It's also in the cytosol and in the nuclei of different cells. It's a really rare property among receptors to, to physically be in so many different places at the same time. Um, and with these unique abilities, it can also regulate the cell's response to growth factor stimulation and, and cell migration too. And it's not just um, even in the skin, right? It, we, we find this phenomenon even in places like uh, muscle, uh, smooth muscle cells, actually. Uh, and when you look at what else might be on the membrane, we find receptors like TLR2 and, and TLR4 as well, um, toll-like receptor. And when, H, when HA is degraded, the degradation products initiate 
signal transduction, which I've just explained, through either of these receptors specifically, CD44 or RAM. In macrophages and dendrite cells, both can potentially be activated at the same time, um, as far as I personally understand. I, I, I may be wrong on that. However, we, we really are now edging towards the limit of what the entire scientific community as a whole understands. So just bear that in mind um, when we talk about things in, in this much detail. Unless new research is published in the future, I'm sure it will at some point, we currently believe these receptors to be part of the immune system. So what that actually means is that hyaluronin can actually trigger immune regulation. So when we look at immune responses from dermal fillers and skin boosters, this is the reason why. I've said for God knows how many years, certain fillers excite the immune system if you don't manufacture them right. My personal belief is that fillers like Juvederm shouldn't even be allowed to be sold because of how absolutely terrible they are. Um, I, I will go into more detail on things like this later when I, when I scrutinize Revenes with a fine tooth comb and put it to the test. Uh, yeah, but for now, if you're using Juvederm, I think to put it politely, you need to learn more about hyaluronic acid, frankly. When you see well-known doctors using it and saying how great it is, let's be honest, they're, they're either being paid to say it or, or they get a great discount on it or they haven't got a clue about anything I've been speaking about and will speak about in this video. Usually it's uh, it's, it's some combination of, of the three from what I've seen and it's appalling and embarrassing, um, obviously. And, and as I've said before, it's one of the reasons I'm making this video to, to show people how little the speakers we listen to actually know. But anyway, I'm gonna repeat myself, I'm gonna go off another rant, bring it back. Um, and it really pisses me off that. Um, where was I? Um, signaling pathways, right. Okay, so, so other, other receptors, uh, yeah, signaling pathways and other, other receptors outside of CD44. So there are loads of other receptors I, I could go on about. Um, I've, I've just gone, I mentioned a couple other ones like TLR2 and, and TLR4 because A, um, I really am quite hungry now. I normally have a delivery route. And, and B, just so that you can appreciate that signaling systems aren't this straight, linear, 100% predictable domino effect. They're this incredibly complex interwoven network um, which are initiated by all sorts of things in the ECM, hitting multiple receptors all at the same time. ECM is not this still thing that does one thing at a time. And when we have irregularity in the expression or, or function of these receptors, then we get numerous pathologies that we know of today. For instance, it, um, on this channel, if you watch my video, I, I've made a video on, on niacinamide, right, on this channel. You'll see that I've taught about the nutrient inhibiting the TLR2 receptor, which then reduces the production of interleukin-8, um, which in turn then reduces inflammation because interleukin-8 is heavily implicated in perpetuating, in per perpetuating, perpetuating inflammation. I'm really hungry now. Um, and when we have more understanding, we can make cures for diseases. For instance, another exceptionally interesting example, when I fir which I first read about when I was I don't know, in somewhere in school, I think I was probably about 15 or something, is using receptor findings to cure things like HIV. Now, I'm not gonna go into the exact mechanism of, of how the HIV cure works or which complexes we create in the process of curing it. Um, but, you know, if you ever see me in person, more than happy to explain it to you. But that's what what the kind of incredible things are that you can achieve if you really understand receptors. So when we look at our understanding of, of the CD44 uh, receptor so far from this video, we've looked at how, you know, how signal transduction works to create a, a conformational state change on the receptor um, on the internal end of the protein. We've looked at, you know, is it, and what happens after this point in receptors, generally speaking, is that they then interact with cytoplasmic proteins inside the cell, and that in turn then regulates gene transcription. But what makes CD44 so unique is that it can actually bypass that last step. 
CD44 can activate gene transcription by itself directly and without any intermediate steps like going through cell uh, proteins or cytoplasmic proteins. So membrane to DNA directly. And it, and it happens to by means of a membrane metalloproteinase enzyme, also known as M MMP. Um, proteolytically cleaving the receptor <clears throat> at the bit that's external to the cell and, and facing the ECM, which acts the, as the HA binding site. Now this section of the receptor is called the ectodomain. And after ectodomain cleavage, cell migration begins. And that's exactly how HA can regulate cell migration through CD44 interaction, the cleavage of the, of the receptor. The direct affecting of the genome to induce transcription specifically induces the CD44 gene. So this regulatory circuit is what gives us such a rapid turnaround of CD44 protein in order to keep facilitating cell migration continuously. But when membrane MMP enzymes block this regulatory system, the rapid turnaround of the receptor protein isn't seen anymore. This is why modulation of uh, HA to CD44 binding affinity is so important for cell migration ability in, in, in such a HA-rich extracellular matrix. Um, in fact, before I carry on, I, I should probably appreciate that some of you don't know what cell migration means. I'm sure you understand what the word migration means, but you might not understand why a, a fibroblast or a keratinocyte in skin might need to move its position. Um, but you know, don't worry, it, it's very simple. Cell migration is basically the process by which, oh, I should have shaved. Um, the, it's a process by which cells can be positioned in three-dimensional space to create an advanced architecture. Um, and this is what allows an organ to, structure to take shape. So keratinocytes is an example, right? They need to be lined up adjacent to each other and spread laterally in two dimensions. Fibroblasts, on the other hand, need to be relatively evenly spaced out in the dermis, and, and they, they have to have space in between them all in order for the ECM to exist, because if there's no space in between them, there's nowhere for them to pump out products like, like collagen, as an example, uh, or hyaluronic acid, I should say. Um, but when we, when we inhibit this process by cleaving CD44's ectodomain, we can actually inhibit tumor cell migration too, because tumors, like cancer cells, actually express CD44 also. And this is how they metastasize. Again, if you know me personally, you'll know that I've been saying there's a link between HA and cancer metastasis for many, many years now. I've never had time to fully explain that link in any talk I've given, but I guess this is the beauty of, of YouTube, I guess, right? I can teach things that I generally won't have an opportunity to teach elsewhere. <clears throat> Another interesting um, function of CD44 is that it helps position cells uh, and, it, and it acts as like a foundation of, of a bridge. So imagine that when a HA chain becomes bound to CD44, doesn't mean that another portion of the same chain can become bound to another CD44 receptor on another cell. This way you can position fibroblasts in the dermis in the right place and also kind of keep them there by using HA as a sort of connecting rod of a, of a certain size, a certain distance, across all these cells and they're held in place like scaffolding. And it can even act as a, as a sort of, um, how should I put it, like a sort of Broadway stage um, instead of a bridge foundation, right? So on this stage, we, we have the ability to facilitate chemical processes. And these processes are the plays that the chemical actors perform, the, the products and the reagents. And it works by sort of catching and concentrating in one place things like growth factors, and then connecting the substrates uh, with, with, with their cor corresponding enzymes. And this allows long distance and short distance events to be concentrated in one place on one cell surface. So the receptors are like those grabbing machines and in our cage stores where you pick up candy and you bring them next to each other. Um, now I know that's quite a lot of information on CD44 structure and function, so I would probably do well to summarize it for you to make it a little bit more digestible. Um, so CD44, number one, CD44 can bind ECM molecules, mainly hyaluronic acid, which then affects cell behavior. Growth factors can also you know, do the same thing and they can partake in this behavior up uh, behavior regulation, 
by using receptors as platforms of chemical process facilitation. And this then in turn further helps regulate the ECM quality even more. CD number two, CD44 can also act as a co-receptor that mediates signal transduction. It can, number three, it can provide a direct link between the cell membrane and cell cytoskeleton that connects to everything in the cell. If you read between the lines here, what some of you clever viewers might be able to work out is that the binding of molecules with receptors means that these macromolecules can actually be concentrated in certain areas of the ECM so that the ECM can almost act um, as a sort of, like a, what's the word, like, like a depot, right, um, of, of regulation molecules and, and hyaluronic acid, as well as its degradation components, um, providing an information system that signals about the state of the ECM to every cell that's, that's nearby. And this is why the ECM is everything, right? If you're trying to create better looking skin. This is why if you start mixing random products like Sunacos and polynucleotides and HA brands all together, all you can do is create such an eclectic and useless mashup in the ECM that you can't get a meaningful response out of the cell. I've seen professors and consultants mixing things like the products I've just mentioned and injecting them all in one syringe. Are you mental? If you ever see something like this, and clearly they have no idea what they're doing. I've seen people teaching skin courses where they're showing delegates to inject something like, say, Sunacos again, in one area, and then a centimeter away, they're using another HA and amino acid combo product on the, on the same face. You seriously have to have such little knowledge about HA if you think that's a good idea, honestly. Like I said, if you see someone teaching that, walk away, do not pay attention to them. I'm gonna guess that they have practically no understanding of the ECM and, and, and hyaluronic acid and HA receptors, etc. like the understanding you now have by watching this video. For instance, you've probably noticed that in certain filler treatments there's a reduced lymph drainage, which, which kind of just makes the whole area look um, what's the word I'm looking for? Puffy, right? You know what I mean? Uh, and we get it around the eyes. And it can look awful. And it accentuates the look of having an eye bag. Um, there's, a, there's a factor at play when this happens, and, it, and it's in regards to filler chemistry. Oh, should I got some more? No. Um, filler chemistry, yeah. So as we know, HA performs its major functions in the ECM by interacting with proteins, affecting hydrodynamics, ion exchange. But it can also affect the transportation of compounds in two opposite directions, right? From the blood vessels into the cell, and from the cell into the lymphatic vessels. So by not paying attention to your filler, you can impair lymph drainage. It's not that filler in general reduces lymph flow per se, is that filler choice can make a big impact on lymph drainage. Some fillers that have better chemistry and rheology and um, you know just, just general physical factors, they're not gonna affect lymph drainage as much. HA also helps activate exchange of metabolites like um, certain ions like, like calcium, potassium, and even gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, between the bloodstream and the cells. And it does it by creating channels, right? You get these channel-like structures in the ECM and that helps migration. It's like a motorway within the ECM that you drive down. And we have around 15 grams of HA in the body of an average 70 kilogram man. Now most of that is, as I said, in the epidermis and dermis. Um, second to that we have, you know, synovial fluids of joints, um, eyeballs, and connective tissue, right? To name just a few places. And out of the 15 grams, five to seven is, is cleaved in a day and the same amount's made. So everyone going around saying, you know, all your HA is going to be replaced over 24 hours. No, it just doesn't work like that, right? The, the turnover isn't 24 hours, half-life is 24 hours, as I've already said. Half-life means that the original, half the original starting amount isn't there anymore. And in this case, it's replaced. So if you got rid of all the HA in such a short time period, there'd be too much disruption to the ECM 
and in turn, all the functions that it carries out too. So you can't get rid of the whole thing in a day. You see, the ECM is a space, and, and it's made of these kind of spontaneously self-organizing structures made of polysaccharides and proteins. Um, if you didn't know already, even things like our bones and teeth are actually examples of an extracellular matrix. Yeah, an entire tooth and bone are examples of ECM after secondary deposition of calcium phosphate. And other examples include tendon cartilage, basement membrane in, in skin and, and, and other organs, etc., etc. Now, obviously, a tooth, a bone, and some cartilage are completely different things and completely different ECMs, extracellular matrices. This represents to you the difference in molecular composition, as well as the methods for organizing those main components too. Just understand for a second, right, how much variety and complexity there is in this really important structure when it comes to, to making such different things, the, 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 the ECM. The cells in the area, so you know, fibroblasts in the skin and chondrocytes in the cartilage export biopolymers into the ECM where the self-assembly process begins. And that entire process is influenced by cells like macrophages, fat cells, adipocytes, lymphocytes. The, the whole matrix is mainly made up of protein fibers like collagen and elastin within the hydrated polysaccharide gel of say HA and other gags that, that we've talked about already. Now the gel is essentially the basic substance that all the collagen and elastin fibers are kind of plunged into. Think of it like a swimming pool with scaffolding inside. The collagens and elastin give the entire space strength and the gel portion allows things to diffuse through, which we've spoken about already. In fact, around 25% of all water inside us is intercellular and 40% is intracellular. Uh, and this is partly why the turnover rate of HA in our skin and other areas isn't 24 hours. The half-life is. The swimming pool with the scaffolding in, you know, swimming pool being the, 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 the gel phase and the scaffolder being, being the fibers like collagen and elastin, that's so tightly controlled in so many ways that the functions it can provide will be affected far too much if, if the entire thing was turned over in a day. You know, we control so many chemical and physical parameters about it. So finally, like pH, osmotic pressure, volume, temperature, uh, and viscosity, to name just a few parameters. Uh, in fact, you know what? The pH of the ECM and blood are actually pretty similar, to be honest. They're about 7.36. A lot of conformational states of macromolecules and enzymatic activity are pH dependent. Um, in fact, as a side note, uh, this is why certain botulinum toxin brands like Botox, Azalor, Bocature, Nuceva, Dysport, Myoblock, they all have different amounts of spread or diffusion in the skin. It's because of the way the macromolecules change their state when in clinical usage. Uh, I'm not going to go into it right now because that's a big video for another day. Uh, and I am planning on making um, a big toxin theory masterclass in the future similar to this. But for now, if you want the best toxin, use New Siva by Evelus and wait until I make my full toxin theory video, which will probably be just as long as this one, uh, quite frankly. But getting back on track. So hyaluronic acid does play a very important role in maintaining these parameters for our ECM. And this is why it's really important in maintaining our physiology. You know, along with the rest of the ECM, it means we have this kind of coordinator or manager or, or medical director, if you like, that acts as an intermediate between cells and, and, and different structures within us, which controls what our cells are actually doing or going to do. Even our cell membranes are actually directly dependent on the ECM to function optimally because the ECM is a kind of extension of the membrane's external surface's chemical composition. Think back to when I spoke um, about the receptors, 
catching molecules and concentrating them in one place to create a depot of, of, of signaling molecules as one example getting the substrate and the enzyme to, together to kind of make a make a chemical reaction examples like that show us the amount of asymmetry between the outside and inside that there is when it comes to cell membranes you see the the bits of the membrane surfaces that face outside and inside are hydrophilic and the bits within the membrane are hydrophobic this is what allows spontaneous positioning after a protein self-assembles. There's no butler that takes the protein on a plate and files it into the membrane, like filing a document in a drawer. It, it all just happens automatically. The phospholipids in the membrane too, so we're not talking about the receptor, the actual membrane of the cell, the individual units that make it up, the phospholipids, they can easily move laterally and change position up to a million times a second. And they can travel like, you know, one fortieth of the cell diameter in about two seconds. Uh, actually, I'll get a picture on the screen here so this bit is a bit easy to understand, but the flipping movement, whereby one fossil bit goes from the outer half of the membrane to the inner, is much more rare. That will only happen, I, I don't know what the numbers are, probably something like once a month, something like that, whereas laterally, obviously, they can move a million times a second. That's the mechanism that allows membrane components um, to, well, it's, it's mechanism that they use to rearrange themselves and form clusters and to create signaling systems, um, as well as you know, receptor associations, and, and they can facilitate transport of molecules without having a mixing of internal and external surfaces, because they can't flip, they can only go sideways. And the asymmetry is really, really important because it allows the two surfaces to function differently. And I think about it, if that didn't happen, any molecule that can go from the external side of the cell to the internal side could just go straight back out again if they were symmetrical and the cell would lose them. So you have to have the asymmetry. Think of the asymmetry as like a festival or an event, right? That you're going to where you need a ticket. You can leave at any point by walking out the exit, but if the entrance is exactly the same, then you get random people just walking in there all the time and only certain people are meant to be allowed in if they've bought a ticket. So you have a ticket gate at the entrance and that's where you check everyone and then you'll, you'll get the right people in. The asymmetry between going in and going out in this analogy is a good way to think about the asymmetry between the two sides of a cell membrane. Only people with a ticket can get in, anyone can just walk out if they don't want to. The amount of asymmetry that there is can vary, right? From cell type to cell type. And not just that, even, even during different um, portions of the cell's life cycle, it will actually change. And when we have this functioning optimally, and we then have the ECM functioning optimally as well, that's when we have perfect hyaluronic acid regulated homeostasis in cells, tissues, organs, because we're maintaining those chemical and physical parameters I spoke of before, uh, as well as we possibly can. And when we achieve that, we also have optimal epigenesis too, which is, how do I explain that? It's, it's embryogenesis and regeneration for optimal development of the organism. Um, but you know, generally speaking, negative feedback is how homeostasis is maintained. For example, if it's too much of something, the excess levels tell the producer gland to stop. Whereas epigenesis, on the other hand, is mainly perpetuated by positive feedback. An example of this could be something like eating, where some people eat and then love it so much that they just can't stop, so they keep doing more of what feels good to them and end up clinically obese. Now, when we utilize hyaluronic acid to do this, we're taking advantage of its properties that we've spoken of already, like binding with, with metal ions and hydrate shells to attract a lot of water. Um, that can, you, know, you, can, you can create a hydrodynamic volume 10 times bigger than the space occupied by the non-hydrated molecules like metal ions. That's the exact reason. It can help us in facilitating migration or adhesion or arrangement of cells 
during embryogenesis and, and, and damage repair in adults too, which, you know, damage repair repeats certain steps that were originally done during embryogenesis. If it doesn't make sense, think about it this way. When we fracture our, our bone, right, the cartilage is initially formed, which remember is an example of an ECM. Uh, so it's laid down by cells. And this is then in turn replaced by bone. Same principle happens in uh, like tooth sockets when an adult tooth is removed. And that's why if you do have a tooth removed and the blood uh, and the blood clot in the socket shouldn't be disturbed. Because if you do, then no bone can be replaced. And you just have this hole with exposed tissues, which can harbor massive infections and cause more pain than whatever the, the toothache was that required the tooth to be extracted in the first place. And all of these functional properties of hyaluronic acid helped us evolve to what we are today as a species. And, and, and it contributes to our um, kind of preservation as the most advanced species on the planet. And that preservation is in part because it's allowed us to create such complex parts of ourselves, like the skin, as an example, right? I know most PowerPoints say the skin has two layers and it also has collagen, etc. But that's such a minimization of what's really in there. And if you want to create good looking skin for our patients, we have to shy away from such a shallow understanding of it. For example, right? We already know now from this video that the majority of HA in the skin is between collagen and elastin fibers, uh, like a swimming pool with scaffolding in it. There's about, uh, I think it's about 0 0.1 milligrams of HA in one gram of raw epidermis tissue, and about 0 0.5 milligrams per gram in raw dermis tissue. Now with this combination, we don't just create all the elasticity that we love, but we also create this highly selective kind of sieve, or what's the word, filter um, that we've spoken of that helps diffusion. But simultaneously, it can help prevent microorganism penetration when we have a wound like a needle piercing the skin. And water generally has two directions of flow here. One is um, blood to the dermis, and two is from the dermis to the atmosphere through the, the stratum corneum layer, the top layer of the skin. Luckily, keratinocytes are able to activate HAS1 and 3 by virtue of their growth factor to offset that. And this is what keeps us having the right amount in the skin. But because the diffusion process is passive, the dermal HA has a very important role in water exchange by using its innate ability to, um, to, to polymerize, to become a polymer with negative charges on one of its functional groups to then attract positive metal ions, which then attracts negative ends of water molecules and, and hydrate shells, as I've looked at already. This is why I never use a moisturizer. I just focus on getting the right ingredients into the cells and all the HA, as well as the stratum corneum to prevent transepidermal water loss take, take care of themselves. There's no biological need to use a moisturizer in my opinion, if you can restore optimal cell function through things like ECM restructuring and essential cell nutrition. Along with my patients that listen to me at least, I'm living proof of this. I never use moisturizer and I never have dry skin. If it's dry, then you need to fix cell function. Slapping a moisturizer on does nothing to address why it became dry in the first place. Wake up. And even when you look at the collagen that's present, there's actually many different types. If you don't know that, then you can't diagnose the factors of pathology well, and then you can't treatment plan well. When most skin injectables only make type one or three, at best, as I've said already, you're not actually helping the elasticity of skin. Because this comes from the tightness of the epidermis joining to the dermis, which needs things like type 17, four, seven, etc. Give yourself a much deeper understanding in areas like this, and you'll create much more dramatic results for your patients. 
And if you're interested in this area specifically, I do have a, a deeply detailed video lecture uh, on my channel talking just about this area that you can watch, the, the connection between the epidermis and the dermis. <clears throat> but having looked at all these biological aspects of hyaluronic acid now, and what it can do for us in certain types and in and, and certain areas, I think you should hopefully have an appreciation for the fact that paying attention to which HA you use is absolutely vital. And this is the reason you'd have deeper discussions with your fellow reps and, and ask more probing questions to speakers on stage that tell you the brand they're being paid to speak for is the best. But in reality, it's absolute crap normally, especially if you've done. Um, and hopefully you have a better understanding now of why certain treatments either didn't work or give subpar results. It's usually the product being crap in the sense that it doesn't respect the ECM as much as, say, Sunacos, or, or maybe you don't realize the best way to inject in order to give the same respect. Either way, with all this knowledge, the next thing you need um, to understand is the actual production methods of hyaluronic acid. This is where each dermal filler, skin booster, skincare brand all have big differences. Um, even if the name of the ingredient that they are using is the same. If you don't understand this, you're never gonna be able to see past marketing nonsense that these companies throw at you to hide the real science behind them. And the production methods have to be seen in the context of what you've learned so far. So in other words, do they produce the hyaluronic acid in such a way that all the functions that we've now talked about can still take place the same as in homeostasis, or will they be altered in some way? And if you understand that, you then understand which ones to buy or not buy. I'll give you a hint before we go any further. With all my knowledge that I've shown you so far and what I'm gonna show you next, at the time of this being made at least, there's only one dermal filler in the world worth buying, and that's Revenus. There's also really only one skin quality injectable worth buying, and that's Sunacos. Speak to you know a Prolinium rep like Sinead if you're in London, if you're interested in Revenus um, fillers, and contact uh, Professional Dietetics to find out how to buy Sunacos in your country. And before you ask, by the way, no, this video isn't sponsored. No one has asked me to make it. I'm also receiving absolutely no payment whatsoever in return for making it, apart from what YouTube might pay me for adverts on the website. So, methods of HA production. <coughs> really dry throat now. Pay attention very closely to this section and rewatch it as many times as you need. The shortcuts that lead to bad products are specifically taken in this part of the journey from getting a HA product into your hands. Some portions might be difficult to understand, um, but you know, putting the effort in to understand is what makes you a better clinician than those that don't care about what they're putting into their patients' faces or bodies, wherever you're injecting. There are many, many games that companies play to make money out of you. As a quick example, let's look at Sinclair Pharma. They make a dermal filler called Miley, M-A-I-L-I. -I. But if you look at another dermal filler called Kysense, K-Y-S-E-N-S-E, they're practically 100% the exact same. The only difference as far as I'm aware is that one has lidocaine and the other doesn't. They even come out of the same factory, in the same city. They use the same data set. They both sell four in a box. They have the same names for each filler in their range, etc., etc. But Sinclair, talk about it like as if it's something completely unique. 
Now, I'm not saying it's a terrible filler by any means, because it, it's not. But I am saying this is an example of how companies don't tell you the full truth about their products. Now, if you're interested, I think it has a long way to go before you get to, to the quality of, of something like Reven S. Um, and that's coming from myself, who I think it will be safe to say, you know, understands HA and HA production better than the average clinician in aesthetic medicine, um, which I hope you'd agree with at this point in the video. Otherwise, I've got some serious rethinking to do. Now, once I go through uh, this, uh, the general overview principles of HA production methods. After that, I'll also go into how Prolenium produces HA to produce their specific demo filler range called Reven-S. Um, so, HA Manufacturing 101. There's only a handful of factories in the world that can actually produce HA that you can order for your, you know, your patient, your treatment. Even though it can be extracted from vertebrate animals in places like rooster combs, the, the red bit on top of, of roosters, the, the floppy bit, um, synovial fluid, umbilical cords, amniotic fluid, all these things, the, the best source is actually to use bacteria. Because when you use animal sources, it's a bit more tricky to get it into the final product when you take into account that you know, it's a business at the end of the day. So because of that, we have to use streptococcus groups A and B. Now, there are still people around using some of the other sources that I've just mentioned because things like rooster combs have very high concentrations of hyaluronate. Um, but the reason that we shy away nowadays is also because of the cross-species virus transmission threat. We've all been through COVID, obviously, at this point. Um, and, and, you know, you, we also get things like the contamination with animal proteins. So because of that, we've gone more towards the bacterial sources I've just mentioned. There's also research currently being done on engineering other sources to produce it, like, um, what was it? Uh, e. coli, I think it was, as an example. Yes, E. coli, because it's a non-pathogenic strain. And, and it can use streptococcus machinery to make HA. But the problem with using E. coli is that it's more difficult to get the kind of weights and concentrations that we need for Hyaluronin's commercial and medical uses. So currently, still, strep lines, streptococcus lines are still the best method that we have. So regardless of, of what you're, we're using, though, you, you really need to understand the importance of purification. Because remember that it's, it's not coming out of a tap here. It's being made in, in, a, in a really big mess of organisms. And the products of these organisms is life cycles that we need to extract it from. If we don't purify it, then what, what happens is we're, we're just mixing it with, with pro-inflammatory molecules of you know, either animal or bacterial origin. Obviously, we don't want that. So to produce it, we use a process called fermentation. Now, for being technical, fermentation is the process of making enzymatically controlled chemical changes, like breaking down glucose anaerobically, as an example. The frothing that you get when making beer is the same thing. And because of the rheological properties of the polymers that we're interested in, realistically, it's only feasible nowadays to produce it in, in, in certain maximum concentrations I'm going to guess probably around, let's say, 5 to 10 grams per litre, something like that, um, because the viscosity of the broth is too high to move masses around above this level. And you just get concentrations of inadequately, inadequately dissolved um, oxygen if you try. So when we get started, we use things called bioreactors with, with parameters inside and, and we can control all these parameters and they then give us control over things like, say, concentration, uh, molecular weight of the HA that we're trying to make. And we can control things like, say, temperature, pH, uh, dissolved oxygen content, cations, uh, metal ions, if you like, nutrients, 
Um, and as, you know, as well as that, the, the availability of all those things that the bacteria can actually use as well. Now, one of the issues with using strep C here, unfortunately, is that they're actually quite a demanding species in terms of nutrient requirements to grow. They're, they're really picky. So the most commonly used conditions right now that we have at the moment, I believe are, are going to be around, let's say, 30 to 37 degrees temperature centigrade, um, 6.5, 7.5 pH. Um, you definitely use glucose for the carbon nutrient source. And then the concentration of everything is, is probably going to be around 10 to 60 grams per liter, I would guess. Now, when we've got everything piled up inside, the bacterial production of HA competes with bacterial growth for prioritization. So you either grow or you make HA. And because of this, the fermentation conditions are usually set to provide some sort of physiological stress, like inadequate nutrient supply, because that can then optimize HA production without compromising the bacterial growth too much. It's always, you've got to, you're trying to fight that balance, basically. Now, Group C strep lines also produce lactic acid um, during this fermentation process I'm going to talk you through. And around 80 to 85% of the carbon supply we give in, in the form of glucose, it's actually used for making lactic acid uh, and, and acetic acid. Only around 5 to 10% on average is used for actual growth and capsule production. I'll explain capsule production soon. Essentially, HA is being produced to make a bacterial capsule, and we take it out during that process for our own needs. Uh, but in addition to this, if we increase the lactic acid content, we end up inhibiting the growth and HA production, which makes it a complete hindrance to us. Um, so you know, these bacteria are thinking, I'm just gonna make my HA capsule. Boom, we go in and take the HA before the capsule is formed, basically. So we have to time the extraction of the HA because of that, and also it's produced along lactic acid, uh, mainly during the log phase of fermentation, whereas the degradation of HA mostly happens during the stationary phase. Uh, but when I say log phase, by the way, what that means is the phase where the growth of the bacteria is happening on a logarithmic scale as opposed to a linear scale. Um, and as you can kind of control the way the bacteria go into the log and the stationary phase, um, but, and you, you can do this by, by having certain conditions, or no, let me rephrase, you can do that by, con by having control, certain controls over the growing conditions. I think that makes sense. And the most common method of fermentation, at the moment at least, I think, is called batch fermentation. So this is where the lines are fermented in a closed ecosystem until the stationary phase is reached. And then the HA is, is pulled out from the bioreactor, it's harvested from the bioreactor. It is, it is very laborious and, and, and labor intensive, shall we say, to do it because, if you do it this way, because there's, you've got constant bioreactor turnover. And some people think that if you do a continuous culture, it can prevent the stationary phase from being reached. So that way you might be able to reduce the risk of HA degradation in there. Um, this is, as far as I understand it, this is because it can avoid the production of degradation enzymes, as well as preventing the release of contaminating uh, like intracellular proteins from the bacteria and, and toxins, which make the next stage, the purification stage, much, much more complicated afterwards. In practice, what happens? Well, what, what you see is that you're gonna decline in HA production anyway, even if you have a continuous culture, where there's just a continuous supply of nutrients to try and prevent reaching a stationary phase. Um, this is partly due to the instability of the HA producing phenotype. Um, and so because of this batch fermentation, I, I would say is, is still the method of choice in factories all over the world today. However, there are still, I, I think there are still some places that do continuous fermentation. I think there's a place in Scotland called Hyatech or, or Hyaltech, I'm not sure. Um, they produce HA specifically for use, like th things like ophthalmics or I think bone fillers and, and arthritis treatments. Um, and I know that I think they, they prefer continuous batch, but they're, they're in the minority for sure. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually, I read a paper um, that talked about strep equi, streptococcus equi, being replaced with streptococcus zoopidemicus. I think I'm saying that right. Um, that's a subspecies of equi. 
um, and they were talking about sort of using that in the production line because it was thought that maybe that could help optimize the yield and the molecular weight at the same time. I, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't become the global commercial norm at the minute, um, but who knows for the future. People are always writing papers on HA fermentation methods, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. In some parts of the world, there's, there's even ongoing research into, into producing HA using cheaper uh, and more environmentally friendly ways, like maybe using soy, um, agriculture derivatives, fishing industry byproducts, and even things like apple juice, I think, once, I think. I might be wrong, maybe I made apple juice up. Uh, but people are always looking to genetically engineer methods like this because we always have that concern, right, that, that strep is, is pathogenic. So what if it goes wrong one day? And so that's why we're always looking into alternative methods. In fact, there are a few different things to know about using strep equi subspecies like equi or suipidemicus for HA production. First of all, strep is gram positive. This means if you do a gram stain test, it will come out positive. And it means it has a particular type of cell wall that's thicker than gram-negative species. They're generally spherical in shape, but they can also grow in, in quite long chains. Now, strep, um, they're also facultative anaerobes. What does that mean? It means that they can produce energy in the form of ATP when oxygen is present, but they can switch to fermentation if there's no oxygen. So they don't produce catalase, right? Which is an enzyme generally found in all organisms that are exposed to oxygen. And this enzyme can break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And finally, as I said already, they have very strict needs for nutrition and their environment if you want them to do their best work. Work. Uh, now most of the strep species, and there are, I think there's about 49 that we currently know of as far as I'm aware, they can cause invasive infections in humans. The most common ones are things like strep pyogenes, um, strep uh, agalactiae, and, and strep mutans. In fact, if you're a dentist, by the way, I'm sure you've definitely heard of strep mutans at some point in your career. Um, now, why specifically do strep species even produce hyaluronic acid in the first place though? Well, the HA capsule that they have regulates their virulence and pathogenicity. So it's a tool, the HA. As far as we know, the, the capsule allows them to get past our immune systems and it stops them being recognized or identified. And that allows them to kind of go in in stealth mode and infect their host, infect us more optimally. And it works because as we're all aware now, HA is in the ECM. To, to understate it. So the HA coating of the bacteria acts like a sort of invisibility cloak where the host just sees the HA and not the bacteria underlying it. So it thinks it's, it's, it's just another part of itself. We, we don't recognize it. And that also correlates to less of the bacteria undergoing phagocytosis to, to ensure its, its survival because it's not detected, it's not recognized and, and alarmed. And so because of that, HA is, is a major player in making bacteria harmful by working alongside um, streptolysin S, which breaks down red blood cells, and an M-like protein, um, M as in the letter, M-like protein, um, that shields the bacteria from the immune system. Um, the M-like protein does it by preventing the attachment of opsonin molecules to the bacterial surface, and, and these are molecules that enhance phagocytosis. And so the interference here reduces the formation of something called the membrane attack complex, which decreases the likelihood of the immune system killing the bacteria at the end of the day, if, if you want to summarize it. And the membrane attack complex, if you don't know, um, it's a part of our immune system's defense mechanism to set up proteins that form pores in the bacterial membrane. And then that helps us to, to destroy them. It's like a hole punch, if you like. Uh, they hole punch the bacteria to help us destroy them. And, and that adaptation of interfering with our immune system's membrane attack complex by the M-like protein is what helps the bacteria specifically resist the immune system. And both the, the M-like protein and the hyaluronic acid are essential, crucial, 100% crucial 
for the bacteria to defend itself against being engulfed by immune cells in our body through phagocytosis. Now, as far as we know, HS shields the bacteria by physically obstructing oxidants and cell binding proteins. The idea is that, is that HA's negative charges in solution that we spoke of before, oh, my back, and the subsequent hydrophilic properties create a barrier that the oxidants struggle to penetrate. And that's what makes a shield for the bacteria. Um, but at the moment, there, there isn't, you know, there is not, I don't think, 100% consensus on, on this mechanism. And some people will say that HA works by physically preventing immune cells from, from making contact with deposited oxidants too. I don't know what the exact answer is, but I, I know there's discussion on it now. Um, on top of that, research has also been published, published which says that bacteria can actually form aggregates or groups, almost like a cluster, and that can help protect them from the reactive oxygen species produced by the immune system as part of its sort of attack strategy is this torpedo that it fires. And then the clustering up of the bacteria can, can reduce their exposure to these harmful substances because they're kind of making a human, uh, not human shield, a bacterial shield by using each other, if that makes sense. So when they make HA, they typically use five genes. First one, hyaluronic synthase A, also known as HAS-A for simplicity, it puts together the HA chain. Next one is, is two genes, HAS-B and C. Um, so th they create one of the two building blocks of HA, such as glucuronic acid, as we've spoken about near the, the beginning, beginning of the video very briefly. Then there's two more genes, D and E, HAS-D and HAS-E, which produce the other building block called N-acetylglucosamine. And these two building blocks make a HA monomer, and when they're put together, and, and when they're repeated many times, you obviously get the HA polymer. Now, I'm not gonna get into which gene does which final job to create the final polymer, because that really is far too much detail, and it will just confuse the hell out of people, because, well, okay. There are some very long names and, and, and words involved in, in talking about that subject, you know, like N-acetylglucosamine 1-phosphate uridyl ditransferase, um, which is the enzyme that HAS-D codes for. Now, there is also some variance in how these genes line up in the actual gene sequence, depending on which subspecies you're looking at. But again, you don't need to know that level of detail, to be honest, and then that's coming from me. who loves massive amounts of detail, as you can tell. However, it is interesting to know how we can manipulate the bacteria for HA production. So if we do that, we can, we can better analyze which HA sources for our dermal fillers are more up-to-date with the research and see which filler brand is maybe using an old-school manufacturer just because it's cheaper. And there are ones out there that do it, as you can probably guess. There was a very interesting study a while back. Um, I think the reference is, I think it's Chan or Chen 2009. I think it's Chen 2009. I'll, I'll put it on screen. Um, they looked at the impact of activating the five genes in the Haas system that I spoke about uh, just now using a nicin inducible vector, which is basically a tool that you can turn on or off using nicin, which, which is a natural bacterial protein. And as they found out um, the, the results, they were looking at what happened, they realized that there's some really interesting things happening and really interesting things about hyaluronic acid production when they fiddled with these knobs and switches in, in, in the genome. When they turned up the activity of the HAS-A gene, they got more HA. But it was all shorter chain when compared to the normal bacteria, say, to the reference HA. But on the other hand, when they turned up the activity of HAS-C, they got less HA. And turning up D and E at the same time also made less HA. But what I find quite interesting is that increasing the activity of HAS-E on its own made the HA chains longer, as did just having an empty vector plasmid, which was meant to actually be used as a control. Now, if you don't know what a vector plasmid is, it's a small, like, circular piece of, of DNA and we can use it to carry genes into a host cell so that the host, you know, in this case the bacteria, can use the information to make stuff it might not normally make. 
think of it as a CD disc that you, if you remember CDs, you insert it into the bacteria, it reads it and it and it can do something it couldn't do before. Now that's what that's what a vector plasmid is. Now this made for interesting reading for the researchers. So they looked into having just the empty plasma on its own in there to see what that might do to gene activity and HA production. Somehow, I have no idea how, they found that it actually led to a slowdown in the activity of an enzyme called MUR-A, M-U-R-A, um, which is involved in making peptidoglycan, which is a bacterial cell wall component. Now this enzyme actually competes with Has enzymes with the key ingredient N-acetylglucosamine, which is one of the building blocks of the HA monomer. They managed to figure out that when Muir A's activity is turned down, there's more N acetylglucosamine available for making HA as a result. Before that study, it was thought that the size of hyaluronic acid depended solely on the ratio of its two building blocks, right? N acetylglucosamine was considered the, the limiting factor. Anyway, either way, there's, there's something very important that any clinician providing dermal filler treatments needs to know here. And that's the fact that there's always a degree of pro-inflammatory molecules present in the mixture, such as low molecular weight HA. Low weight HA is pro-inflammatory. But on top of this, we also have to worry about things like endotoxin as well. What's endotoxin? Endotoxin is a lipopolysaccharide component of cell walls of gram-negative bacteria. Now, if you remember rightly, I said that strep species are a gram-positive species, so it, it's not too much of an issue for us. However, we, we still need to know um, about it when we realize that people are trying to, uh, what's, what, what's the phrase, sort of genetically engineer different or alternative methods of HA production. And we can still find certain amounts of it because whilst gram-positive bacteria don't produce endotoxins, they can produce other cell wall components that yield similar responses in humans. For instance, lipotechoic acid in the cell walls of, of gram-positive bacteria can also provoke inflammatory responses in us, similar to those caused by genuine endotoxins as well. And when endotoxin comes into our system, Okay, several things can happen, like inflammatory responses. And when they're recognized as foreign invaders, they activate the immune system, leading to, to localized symptoms like redness, swelling, pain, uh, maybe even systemic ones if things get, get worse, like fever. Now, if there's a really high amount or they get into the bloodstream, the inflammatory response can become systemic and impact the entire body. Now, as I said, it's not something that's that's rife in HA production nowadays, um, especially using strep lines. However, even small amounts can have an impact. How many times have you seen patients reacting to a dermal filler and you can't explain why? These are the sorts of things that you need in your arsenal of knowledge to understand phenomena like that, which you see clinically. Now, strep lines are, are more likely to give us peptidoglycan remnants in the product rather than endotoxin. But that's still something we have to ask our filler brands about. Peptidoglycan is found in, in the cell walls of both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, such as streptococcus. But it doesn't have the lipid portion, lipid with a P, not liquid, lipid portion characteristics of endotoxins. Now saying that though, even without it, can still trigger immune responses because it's a, it's a piece of a bacterium at the end of the day that our body will try to get rid of. And if it makes, and, well, and it makes sense, it does make sense that we could find bits of it in the mixture at the end. Because remember the HA being produced is, as far as bacteria are aware, for the capsule that encases them. Companies that take shortcuts in this process other ones to avoid. <clears throat> that's why purification is so important, and that's what I'm going to go through now. So, purification. There are, there are loads of steps to filter in the culture media out of the bioreactor before we can get the HA out. And even with all the processes that we have, 
my personal opinion is you're probably only going to get say about 30% yield from the initial HA concentration in the culture medium. Now I don't have any evidence for that but based on my expertise in the area it's just my best guess that's all. But you know generally speaking there are many methods to get the HA out before purification and there are a lot of patents for it too, as I'm sure you can imagine, because it's, it's, it's a very lucrative business. In fact, there are so many different specific ways that you could talk for a full day or maybe even a week just on that. Each factory will carry out the same principle like starting products or parameter control during fermentation, but there's, there's a lot of variation amongst it. Um, for example, some, some might have two sessions of fermentation. Some might use agitation during production, like stirring. Some might use magnesium salts or, or sulfates, etc., etc. They all do things slightly differently, but the principle they're trying to, to carry out is for the same purpose. Uh, the reason it can be so complex is that we, we have a really big challenge in the right extraction technique and strategy when you consider that the original sources, i.e. fermentation broth, um, they, they represent a really complex system that has a lot of components and, and solutes which can complicate the output of um, speedy ex or high extraction rates and, and purity. When you're choosing an isolation method or, or a purification method, it's important to maintain the intrinsic properties of the polysaccharide during the whole process. Otherwise, there's just no point. You're destroying it dur during the extraction process. One method that's been looked at in the past is, is using hot water extraction because most polysaccharides have a really high solubility in water and are more stable in hotter water. Uh, another method um, could be that maybe, maybe you use enzymes, right? And the enzymes digest things for you. But whichever way you go, every method has its advantages and, and disadvantages when it comes to balancing cost, purity, um, environmental impact, speed, etc., etc. As a very rough rule, the cheaper methods will give you a lower purity because you, you're cutting corners, right, by reducing steps um, and reagents even in the overall process. And this isn't just true for the HA factory, but the filler company when they receive the product and turn it into the injectable syringe, into, the, into an actual dermal filler that you can use as well. And using enzymes, like one of the examples I just gave, is, is quite expensive. Um, it's also time consuming, and there's a significant number of reagents required to hydrolyze the tissue, as well as heat treatments, which you need to do, you know, and they're required to stop the hydrogels, um, to, sorry, to stop the hydrolysis um, process uh, afterwards. On the other hand, you've, you've got organic solvents, and these are cheaper, they don't need any enzymes or heat treatment anyway, uh, they're easier to use, and they're less time consuming. But nowadays, you know, the optimization of our extraction methods is really important, so that we can ensure an efficient isolation with high purity at low cost, while also being reasonably quick and environmentally safe. That's what makes the extraction and purification process, more, in my opinion, more important than the production process, um, like I said, at least in, in my opinion, and I'm sure in, in a lot of people's eyes, actually. We need, to, we need the final product to be quite obviously a high yield and, and a high molecular weight because so it doesn't inflame things, but it needs to be uniform across the entire batch. Uh, and, and that's a lot of boxes to tick. And when you're using bacteria like strep species, the risk that the factory takes um, is, is well, the risk they have to work around, I should say, is, is the contamination. You know, it's not just the bacterial endotoxins that I mentioned before, but also nucleic acids, proteins, heavy metals and things. These can all come into the, the mixture if, you, if you've got bacteria, because they're in bacteria as well. That's why we ended up looking at alternative organisms, like I mentioned before, like soy, which can be genetically engineered to express HA um, synthesis genes for the high weight polymers and high purity, but you, you won't have to separate a lot of toxins out of the mixture. Um, now, please understand, as I said before, that it would be impossible 
to go through how every single factory makes their HA. Most, if, if not all of them, won't even tell you some of their fermentation, extraction and purification processes because they're proprietary and or patented. So how is HA extracted and purified is like saying, how does a car work? That there are general principles that each car follows that make it use the fuel to turn the wheels, but each one does it in a way that's unique to that car manufacturer. So when you're shopping for HA, it, it's similar to shopping for cars in this way, and each manufacturer is gonna have its own way of going from fuel to turning wheels, from bacterial strains to packaged up HA to send to the customer. What's useful for you though, as, as a clinician here, is to at least have some sort of general overview. You know, and, and, and generally speaking, what happens is that you prepare the mixture in the you know, for the bioreactor in what, whatever method you've chosen or created, gets fermented with factory specific parameters, and then maybe you incubate it for some time, you might put some kind of additive in there, and then you centrifuge it perhaps to separate out the components, take out the bit that you need like PRP, and, and, and this bit might even happen more than once in certain places depending on their individual preference. After that, you'll, you'll most likely have some steps like to wash it or to filter it. Um, and, and then you, you're followed, following that with some sort of maybe size exclusion chromatography where the customer's ordered a specific weight and, and you've got to give them that, sp or, or extract that specific weight out of the mixture. And then finally, once you've done that, you calculate your yield from, from what you started with. To show you how much variance there is in that, because it's huge, trust me. What I'm gonna do is, is walk you through one particular paper that was published in 2013, uh, when I was a student actually, um, studying dentistry, no doubt. Um, and you can't tell I'm a dentist, can you? And the methods in this paper managed to achieve a purity of, I think it was around 99.2%. I was so impressed. Um, and and I'll, if I, I'll put the paper on screen if, if I can find it again, um, just in case you'd like to take a look as well. Now in the paper, they used Strep Equi subspecies Zoopidemicus. Um, the strain is, is initially maintained as a freeze-dried culture, four degrees centigrade. What happens is they, they grow it at 1% concentration, a specific type of broth called a Todd Hewitt broth, um, so that they could provide optimum uh, sources like carbon and nitrogen in order to fuel the growth as, as well as possible. Then what they do is they, they take all of that, they use batch fermentation, put it into a bioreactor, I think it's around 25 litres, and the working volume is around 12 litres of, of, of the fermentation medium. And the whole bioreactor is, you know, before it's done, it's, before it's used, it's autoclaved and sterilised at 121 degrees C, 15 pounds per square inch for, for about 20 minutes or so, and then it's called to room temperature, so it's sterile. Then they use agitation, and uh, spinning turbines, shall we say, and, and I think that goes for a couple hundred RPM, like two to 400 RPM. And the entire time, the mixture is maintained at 7.2 pH. You do that by just balancing it using sodium hydroxide um, and the simultaneous aeration does the same thing. And they can keep the temperature around 36 degrees C with that. And, and the whole time, glucose is constantly fed. And that's to try and maintain the level inside. And after about 20 hours, heat just destroys all the bacteria at the end of the fermentation process. And the way they know when to kill the process um, because the batch is ready, is by measuring something called OD. Um, if you don't know, that's optical density. It's given as a function of a specific wavelength. So for instance, here, they use OD at 530 nanometers, and the reading was 4.7. The reading is basically a measure of the absorbance of, a, of the material, of, or by the material, of a specific wavelength, and it's given as a logarithmic intensity ratio. In layman's terms, you shine a light on it, uh, on the mixture, and based on what you see, you can tell if it's ready or not. That's it. Um, obviously, with all that we know now, isolation and purification come next. So the whole broth, uh, once that's done, everything's killed, um, the whole broth, which had, I think, more than like two grams per litre of HA, that was precipitated out with isopropyl alcohol. Well, the HA precipitate 
is then re-dissolved in 0.15 moles sodium chloride solution, table salt solution, in 0.15 mole concentration, so that they could reduce the viscosity and the concentration of HA down to about 0.01 grams per liter. And when you have that, the nucleic acids and the proteins and the bacteria are taken out by reducing the pH down from six to about two by adding 0.1% TCA. And that works because they're not gonna survive in, in, in a more acidic con uh, environment. If you've ever read about or done chemical peels, I'm sure you know what TCA is. Um, so after that, they treat it with charcoal at one to two percent for an hour. That separates out all the impurities, and then it's centrifuged at 7,000 RPM for, I don't know, probably about 30 minutes, something like that, with the temperature right down at about four degrees C. Once you then take out the cells and, and, and charcoal with that method, because of the ability of it to absorb, you send the HA solution through a filter. And the one they use, I think, in this process is about 0.45 micrometers. Now, once it's gone through, you then dilute it and send it through ultrafiltration to further refine it and then reconcentrate it to the original volume using a very specific ingredient. Um, they use isopropyl alcohol, which, as, as we know, is um, it's a disinfectant, right? I'm sure you've probably got some in your house somewhere. And this can take out any residual endotoxins left after the filtration stages. And then finally, you're left with white fibers of pure sodium hyaluronate. And that can be precipitated out and vacuum dried. Uh, I'll put a picture up on screen here of, of what it physically looks like. Traditionally, you might use things like enzymes, um, organic solvents, um, detergents or resins with negative charges to try and release the hyaluronic acid from the complexes it's formed with, with other polysaccharides and, and proteins and, and, and whatnot. The issue with that, in my opinion, is that there's a higher cost and, and it becomes difficult to completely like 100% remove exothermic products like proteins and nucleic acids. So when you have processes that are very scaled up, and they will be because we're talking about the cosmetic medicine industry here, you tend to find that option less and less. Um, and, and, and this study found a way of getting that purity, but at exceptionally low cost compared to all the conventional or traditional methods. Part of that cost saving was using things like TCA, 0.1%, and, and activated charcoal um, before being centrifuged, which, let's be honest, are pretty cheap materials wherever you go, charcoal and TCA. Um, that charcoal is, is is there because it can absorb all the impurities and get it out very easily for very little cost. The isopropyl alcohol, when it produced a precipitate, i.e. the final HA, that recovered around 72.2% of the HA, which is a really good yield, to be honest. Um, in other places like Hyaltec, who use a different fermentation approach, I, I'd guess they'd probably get about half that at best. Um, and of that 72.2% that they recovered, 99.2% was pure. Um, I think I mentioned that already. But anyway, you look at Amazon for isopropyl alcohol, you have massive tubs and bottles for it for, for next to nothing. And not only that, the weight that was produced in this paper was just spot on. They got an average of 2.5 megadaltons or 2,500 2, kilodaltons, which is perfect for use in dermal fillers. You're going to get much less incidences of adverse events in terms of reactions to the gel in vivo. And, and when they tested the quality of the final 99.2% pure HA, they ended up with NMR spectroscopy, nuclear, nuclear magnetic resonance, showing them that the properties of it were really, really similar to reference HA, which means it's perfect to use in medical applications too, like thermal fillers. Now, usually you end up with a powder, right? Whenever you order from a factory um, of HA, which is white. The advantage of ending up with fibers instead of powder is that when you, when you stir it to create your final dermal filler after you've bought it and you're trying to make it into a gel that can go into a syringe, you're, you're putting less sheer stress into the mixture in, in, in a fiber form, um, which and sheer stress can degrade the polymers if, if it was a powder. So fibers, are theoretically at least, I would say allow for better preservation of the high weight HA you're ideally gonna be using. Um, as, as a side note, by the way, um, one of my favorite factories, favorite factories, God, that sounds nerdy. 
um, for HA production is HTL in France. Uh, a very commonly used one is Bloomage in China. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that personally, um, but one of the things that makes HTL unique among HA producers is the fact that it can produce HA in fiber form instead of powder. Now, as far as I'm aware, there is literally no one else in the world that makes it in this form, but I could be wrong. As well as that, there's not many papers out there that describe a fermentation extraction purification methodology that makes you end up with fibers instead of powder. So even though HTL will never release every step taken during their production process, I personally think they're using something extremely similar, if not identical, to the process I've just described for you here by analyzing this paper. At the time of making this, I've never spoken to HTL, um, but I have tried. I, I sent them an email a while back to ask if I could speak to one of their scientists just so I can you know, learn from them over a Zoom call or something, um, but they, they never replied, unfortunately. Um, but I am going to France tomorrow for a conference, so hopefully I'll come across them and, and, and interrogate them, who knows. Uh, but anyway, as a customer that's interested in making dermal fillers, you then have to examine the certification of the product. Um, I'll get one up on screen for you to, to have a look at here. Um, it's called the Certificate of Analysis, depending on who you buy from. And it basically, it gives you the stats of what you've ordered. There's key info on there, like what's on the endotoxin level, protein content, the, the weight of the HA that you've actually ordered, uh, the purity of it, etc., etc. Um, in fact, what I'll do, I'll get a HTL one up for you to see. So um, when we look at this particular one from um, Echelon Biosciences, which are, they're the distributor of HTL, I think, um, it will, everything will be nicely set out. Well, I hope it is anyway. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have to remember it off the top of my head because I probably should have printed it out here. Um, but, okay, so take a look at, um, they'll have the average weight on there. It's probably going to be like, let's say 2,000 kilodaltons or 2 megadaltons, whichever way you want to think about it. Can you see how it's sold as, as 2 megadaltons, but the analysis will show it to be just above or just below 2 on average? Um, that's not because the manufacturing is poor. It's just because it's so difficult to be able to create only one exact weight of HA in a batch. And I, I don't blame any company at all out there for not being 100% accurate on their molecular weights. However... What I would like to see is the standard deviation on that in terms of how far away from the intended weights they are on average. What do I mean by that? So, for example, you can have a company sell you a batch of HA where the average weight is 1,000 kilodaltons, but that could be because there's even amounts of all the weights from 1 to 2,000 kilodaltons. So the average is in the middle, which is 1,000. Or you can have another company which sells you the same average of a thousand, but every chain of the bat in the batch is within 900 to 1100. Obviously you want the one where the chains are what you've actually asked for. So there's no risk of, of you know, unintended reactions to lower weights being injected into the skin. Think of it like buying an LED device. These devices can say they produce, you know, 633 nanometer wavelength light, but that's always just the average at the peak output. If the peak spectral width is so wide that you know you also get as low as like 600 and as high as 666, clearly when you turn the machine on, most of the energy you're using and producing is going to go to waste when it's 633 that you want. Whereas if you buy a Dermalux LED, the worst that you get at the peak is 631 or 635 which makes it objectively the most accurate LED in the world in terms of spectral width. Oh, I'm hungry. So fillers undergo the same principle, right? When you buy a, spe a specific weight and when you order a specific weight from a, from a factory. Now I'm not sure what the standard deviation is from the intended weight for Evaness, but I'll try and find out and, and, and put it on the screen here for you in the edit. You, you can, for the time being, look at something else on the certificate, which hopefully will be there when I, when I put one on the screen, called polydispersity index. Um, sometimes it's just known as a dispersity index as well. Essentially, the closer you get to one, the closer you get to every single chain in that batch, chain of HA, 
being the same length and, and, and the exact same weight. It's, I, I, I can't ex- emphasize to you enough how important it is to ask your filler rep what the weight of their filler is. If the filler has low weight in any form, then you're risking more when you inject it. Only go for a filler that is a high weight. Personally, I would prefer something that's in a 2,500 to 3,500 kilodalton range. There's far too much evidence now to excuse anyone or any brand that thinks it's perfectly okay or reasonable to use low weight in fillers nowadays. Well, at least in my opinion anyway. And when it comes to things like nucleic acids, RNA sequences, it's it's something that's unfortunately not usually presented on the certificate, but we know that they usually interact with proteins. So studying the protein content is an indirect way to make sure that the final product is void of things like nucleic acids and, and, and RNA sequences. Obviously, the HDL batches have such a low amount that it's not actually detectable. I'm sure many people will have the same. Another part of the certificate to check is endotoxin. Obviously, we want this and protein content actually to be as low as possible. In fact, we we basically want everything to be zero or as close as possible to zero apart from HA, obviously, so that we can have maximum purity. If there's also things present, sorry, if there's other things also present, then it can also interfere not just with our immune system, but also the, the actual rheology of the gel. And that's what we're, we're gonna speak about now as well, because the rheology is another way to differentiate between different dermal filler brands and work out which one to buy. So rheology 101, rheology basics. As we know, HA has a very special trait, and that sets it apart from other substances in that its various uh, effects on the body depend on the molecular weight, which is basically how big the molecules are, how long the chains are. It's not something that the scientific community understands with absolute 100% certainty in all aspects, but we're pretty sure it might have something to do with it, uh, you know, being able to organize itself into a specific liquid crystal phase. I've said already that liquid crystals are substances that have a molecular structure similar to a solid or a crystal, um, but they can kind of flow a bit like a liquid. That only happens under certain conditions like temperature, pressure, concentration, so on and so forth. Think of it like how water can turn into ice or steam under certain conditions. In the body, biological liquids can be thought of as you know, self-organized materials that naturally create structures similar to liquid crystals. And there are so many examples of these um, self-organized systems in biology. It's like the, the, the body has evolved to have its own way of organizing things. And hyaluron is, is one of the players in, in this really cool natural process. A good example is when a sequence of amino acids is produced and it just, it spontaneously just orientates itself to make an enzyme or a receptor. Um, Think of, think about buying a load of bricks from a store and they organize themselves into a house. And you're turning HA into a dermal filler is like taking string and then realizing that you can do this. If you do this, you can turn it into a whip because it's quite straight. Or if you do that and coil it up, you can make a rope that can hold tension to lift or pull things. We're essentially doing the same with HAs to make it one, injectable, and two, able to support not only itself, but the soft tissues that overlie it in patients' faces. It's a puzzle of how we take something that's basically a homeostatic regulator and a signaling molecule, as I've gone through in excruciating detail now, into something that's hopefully as inert as possible and can give us physical properties instead of communicative ones. And, and, and this is fascinating for me, how we can take away all its biological property, but its structure is still the same, essentially. It plays roles in important body processes like shock absorption in cartilage, muscle contractions, maintaining skin elasticity, helping blood cells move in, in arteries. And to understand how it works in the body, 
it's important that we study the, the, the viscoelastic properties. It basically means how they respond to forces like, like stretching or squeezing. Unfortunately, uh, you know, studying HA's, uh, the, the, what do I to call it, the viscoelastic properties, is difficult. You know, it's really challenging, both theoretically and practically, because when we measure something in the lab, like how it can project something upwards, like under the skin, like the bridge of a nose or whatever, sometimes it has very little translation into clinical practice when we inject the same amount into our patients. And I, and I cannot stress enough how super, super important this point is, because companies will give you all sorts of metrics like say phase angle or G prime as two examples. But does, does that phase angle measured under controlled conditions give the same projection on every one of your patients clinically? Is, is it even anything close in clinic to what the statistics says it should be? You'll be very surprised as to what the difference is between claimed metrics and what actually happens once it's injected. Never, ever, ever take a sales rep's word for it when they give you metrics like G prime and phase angle, be, you know, because the chemical interaction on an atomic scale gets scaled up to the scale of the entire macromolecule, and the sum of all these minute interactions on an atomic scale affects how the entire liquid crystal st uh, structure behaves when it's in a certain ECM. And unfortunately, it's impossible to recreate with 100% accuracy a live ECM in a lab for you to test your fillers in. Think about that before you get attracted to a particular brand because they've, they've got a filler with a really high G prime and you think that might be great for chins and jaw lines and, and cheeks or whatever. But you know, depending on polymer length, chains can be flexible, semi-rigid, or even completely rigid. And that affects how they're arranged in solution. And because of thermal motion, which can be thought of as heat-induced wiggling on an atomic scale, right? These chains can make different shapes without actually breaking apart. Um, and we have to understand this to get our heads around filariology. Um, you know, heat is just movement on an atomic scale. Two substances, hot, cold. If you zoom in, the hot one's jiggling around. This one's just being still. So to understand the, the bigger behaviors, we use different models. When the molecules form rigid or semi-rigid chains, then you get a, a liquid crystal phase like we talked about. And in this phase, the molecules organize themselves into structured patterns at different levels, from say really small to really big scales. And this is to do with the idea of, of conserving energy when in a particular state or, or formation, um, which underpins the whole of chemistry basically. You know, the only reason any chemical reaction anywhere happens is because it's energetically favorable to do so. Shapes of molecules, you know, in given conditions are determined by the same principle. Which shape allows us to conserve the most energy, right? When we're freezing cold, we might curl up like a ball because this allows us to lose the least amount of heat by changing our surface area to volume ratio to conserve our energy. Chemical reactions live by the same not, not the exact same methodology, but the same principle, if you like, or the same idea, um, as does the shape of hyaluronin. Now, there are various shapes that it, it can take on, like coil, uh, rod, long rods, um, a helix, like a spring, or a loose coil. And among these, that the helix generally seems to be the most energy efficient shape that we have. And understanding all these shapes and behaviors helps us grasp how the macromolecules function in our skin when we inject them. You see, liquid crystals, they've got, um, they've got a small amount of energy associated with their deformation. In other words, their, their molecular structure can be easily altered right, can be easily changed by external factors like slight pressure changes or, or shear flow. And shear flow, if you don't know, is it's, it's a way of causing a substance to flow in parallel layers. Um, so when you rub your hands together like that, different layers rub, running in different directions, but parallel. Um, and so when we make structures in these fluids by using shear flow, we call them structured fluids. Now, if we focus on a specific type 
of pneumatic liquid crystal. In other words, liquid crystals with a really highly ordered orientation or structure. There's two main properties, right? Crystallinity, meaning they have a highly ordered orientation, and fluidity, which means they can flow. Most of the interactions between HA fillers and the ECM that we put them in lead us to this higher order organization. And when it comes to forming really specific structures called uh, pneumatic lyotropic polymers, which are organized structures formed by the interaction of multiple polymers with a liquid crystal solvent, there are a couple of factors to be familiar with. Number one, the concentration and molecular weight of the biopolymer have to be above a certain amount. Number two, the temperature needs to be below a certain amount. And these critical values depend on the type of solvent that you're actually putting them in. So I'll put it to you a little bit more simply. When the, when the HA polymers organize themselves into a special arrangement, it, it's kind of like how Lego bricks or Lego pieces fit together in a very specific way. And that only happens when you have a good amount of HA to start with and when it's not too hot. Because heat, heat is basically just gonna denature the, the structure, right? And it will lose all structure. <clears throat> so that the type of liquid we use to dissolve the HA in also matters, right? So this is how we allow our fillers to be a particular shape so that we can support the skin above it. Okay, certain shapes will give a certain amount of load bearing capacity, if you like. Now imagine you have a bunch of tiny rod shaped molecules in a liquid. They can line up in the same direction, which makes the liquid behave in a special way. The alignment can make the liquid less viscous and more runny. And it also gives a liquid some unique properties, like behaving differently in one direction, maybe in the direction they're lined up, to another direction, maybe perpendicular to that. And that's what we call fluid anistropy. A-N-I-S-T-R-O-P-R-Y. T-R-O-P-Y, yeah. Now, if you change the pH, or the, the acidity, if you like, of this amount of salts in the liquid, it can really affect certain big charged molecules called polyelectrolytes. Um, and the changes can make these big molecules either shrink or expand a lot, like you know, up to five times their original size. And this happens because when the HA is super diluted, all the individual chains just behave like random independent bodies. But when there's a good concentration, like in fillers, there's a sort of spontaneous order to its arrangement. This is relevant because we, we know fillers can expand over time in someone's face. And, and even if there's a certain rheology when we inject, as that filler ages, it's not gonna always be exhibiting the exact same rheology from day one to a couple of years down the line. And, and, and people that go on about, oh, this is a really good G prime. All right, but how does that rheology change over time? It's gonna make my patient look like a plastic doll in two years time. So some big macromolecules like hyaluronic acid in our case are really flexible, um, as we already know now. Bend radius 200 nanometers. They can move and bend in different ways. Um, this flexibility is, just spat on the screen. This flexibility is key because it allows the rod shaped parts known as mesogens within the liquid crystals to line up properly. Now, how those rods arrange themselves is ultimately what determines the unique behavior of each liquid crystal, or in other words, each dermal filler. So what makes hyaluronic acid so interesting to work with in, in this context is that it's so completely different when, it, when it's dry and when it's in water. When it's dry, it can be this plain powder or, or this fibrous looking thing in, in HTL's case. But when it's wet, it can support living tissue like a mattress. It has a lot of electrical charges along its length that we touched on before, the, the carboxyl group of the molecule um, that becomes negatively charged and can attract a metal ion and can gather water, if you remember well. The charges usually push parts of the molecule away from each other because like charges repel. All the north poles of, of magnets will repel each other. Now this stretching makes the molecule extend out rather than curl up. But when you have a lot of hyaluronic acid in a given volume of water, 
the molecules start to get closer and they overlap. The overlapping causes the charges to kind of get shielded from each other. And when that happens, the ends of the molecules come closer together and suddenly you, you get this network that propagates all throughout the gel. And when this happens, it's similar to um, polypeptides in that it can exist in two states in water. An ordered state, like a neat ordered spiral helix, and a disordered state, like just a, a random tangled coil-like mess. Um, and under certain conditions, the HA can suddenly switch from the helix or ordered state to the coil slash disordered state, right? And the dis fillers can do this. The switch is kind of like a single solid melting where the neat structure falls apart. For example, think of an ice cube where the structure is usually quite ordered, but when we change the temperature, it falls apart and makes water. Now, HA doesn't melt like ice, obviously, but it can go from very structured to less structured in, in that kind of analogy. Or in other words, helix to tangled coil by kind of unraveling or, or loosening itself a bit, if, if you want to think of it that way. And that helix to coil change is something that happens in a lot of biological systems and can use different types of big molecules like other polysaccharides, proteins, even nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. This is why it was so important to show you the effort that's needed to remove things like the, you know, DNA, RNA, etc. after bacterial fermentation. Because if we don't, then it's also going to interfere with the HA structure and rheology once we turn it into a gel. And these changes can go both ways, right? So from helix to coil and from coil to helix and back again. Um, like an ice cube going to liquid and then go back to an ice cube again. And, and, and they're triggered by changes in the environment. You know, parameters that I mentioned before, main ones are temperature, acidity, and concentration. Um, you can also look at presence of certain ions itself as, as well. Now the ability to switch shapes is important for biology in general, but also for thermal fillers. For example, it can affect how the filler actually works in our skin, depending on its molecular size. So asking your filler sales rep about these sorts of characteristics is really important. It's, you know, it's not just a typical biological environment that can affect the fillers either. External fields like electric and magnetic can influence the filler while under pressure or having fluidity. This is why doing things like RF treatments, radio frequency treatments, should always be done before fillers, when there's nothing in there, and not after they've been placed. Now we've talked about changing parameters like acidity, uh, concentration, and salt strength, but when you heat HA, you can also see how big changes in how it flows, um, and, you know, again, without changing the size of the molecules either. There have been studies over the years using techniques like NMR, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, and light polarization. And, and these have shown us that a HA polymer has parts which are stiff and parts which are more flexible within, within itself. And the balance between both of these is actually what gives HA its high viscosity in water. It's not that the, the whole thing is stiff. It actually can't be, otherwise it wouldn't mix very well. It's also why the chain interactions with each other in water isn't just about how they attract water, i.e. hydrophilic interactions, but also how they repel water, i.e. hydrophobic interactions. No one ever talks about this, right? The precise balance of both of these is what helps stabilize the structure in the ECM. Think of it as being similar to the, the, the receptors that I described before, where there are hydrophilic bits, which face the outside and the inside of the cell, as well as a hydrophobic bit, which sits in the membrane itself, where there's no water, and the whole set of interactions stabilizes the entire receptor firmly in position within that membrane on that cell. And when chains come together in solution, 
it's not just rods they can make either. They can make, you know, they, they can form structures that look like a honeycomb, which can take up even more space than the individual tangled molecules. And, and the behavior of these honeycomb shapes can change with different levels of saltiness and acidity in the water too. For example, um, you know, going from something like pH 7, which is neutral, to something, let's say, quite alkaline, like, like 12 and a half-ish, is going to immediately make the whole thing less viscous without any molecular weight changes. And that's really crucial to understand if, if you're ever treating patients with skin conditions, like acne, as an example. Because where there's more inflammation, there's a different pH to when the skin is perfectly normal. This is gonna change the behavior of the filler to some extent. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I, I think you shouldn't be using fillers or that it's unsafe to treat um, people with acne with fillers, but it's just something to think about when your treatment planning is all. Um, there's also a there's a, also a cool finding about how different sizes of HA molecules interact with each other in water. For example, if you have a solution um, with long chains, made up of say 3,500 monomers and add shorter chains made up of just 60 monomers together, the long chains actually stop forming their usual structures. It's, it's, like, it's like the short chains break up the associations that the long chains usually form. And this doesn't happen with every single number combination between long and short monomer length. Um, but the discovery is really important for making medicines that contain hyaluronic acid, especially ones that, that rely on rheology as the whole point of the product, like dermal fillers. Now remember this concept of how mixing HAs together can create even more possibilities for filler rheology, by the way. Um, we're gonna revisit it when we take a, a magnifying glass to uh, Revan S by Prolenium. So the rheology demands that you pay respect to polymer shape and size in a filler product. Um, if HA chains get smaller due to some diseases, it can mess up ECM structures and, and functions, as we've spoken about already at great length, I won't go through it again, which is obviously not good. And the honeycomb shapes that we also have are great at resisting pressure, by the way, which is why it's so useful in our bodies. It also holds on to a lot of water, which helps control where other molecules in the fluid are located. Can even lead to the formation of new structures because it squeezes molecules into a smaller space, which makes them interact more. This is a bit like when we, when we spoke of you know receptors clustering together on a cell membrane to create a stage where substrates can be held in place for their corresponding enzymes, and you, and you you force an interaction between them both. HA is actually playing a similar role when it's freely wandering about in the ECM unhindered. Remember also that it's, it's negatively charged on one part of it, so it can bind with positively charged things. This can create insoluble complexes of, of things that don't, don't dissolve well. Um, it, in normal body conditions, it can interact with proteins um, and, and, and lots of other substances without forming these insoluble complexes which can lead to different structures being formed when there's a deviation from normal physiological conditions. Think of insoluble fillers in the context of nodules that won't go away if you need a reason to understand this section well. Um, a paper a while back from, uh, I think it was Ma um, Matsuoka and Komen, or Kalman, however you say it, um, which I'll pop on the screen here for you, came up with two ways to think about how hyaluronic acid behaves in water. So number one, they came up with the non-freely jointed chain model. This basically says that HA forms just a, a loose tangled shape that's mostly water with low densities of HA in there. And the viscosity is related to how much space the tangles take up. Two is the freely jointed chain model. This one is, is basically saying that the HA is more stretched out, like a worm. Now, the viscosity changes 
based on the length of the molecule and not how much space the worm takes up. Um, numerous studies you know, over the years show that shorter chains act like a worm and chain length determines viscosity, while longer chains behave more like loose tangles. There is a specific molecular weight of around 37.5 kilodaltons where it starts to act like a coiled shape. That weight is never something that we're gonna to have to worry about and because it's not something we'll, we'll reach in dermal fillers. So we only really need to think about the freely jointed chain model where chains like worms and the worm size, in other words, HA molecular weight, determines viscosity. But it gives us an important learning point in that because we know in this model that chain size is linked to viscosity, we can infer the average chain size by measuring a manufactured batch's viscosity. And, and this is also why the molecular weight that's given on the certificate with each batch, uh, like the HTL, HTL one, which hopefully I've put up on screen at the time, um, it is only ever gonna be an average. But it's also why we, we kind of have to know the spread from the average, because it's no good having really runny HA with stupidly thick HA in the same batch, giving you the average that you ask for. You obviously want all HA to be as uniform as possible and, and every chain to be bang on the average. Otherwise, some doctors are gonna find it useful and others will find it a complete waste of time. So, you know, if you like to think about it this way, think, to summarize, the real logical behavior of HA acts, it's, it's a special kind of liquid. It's, it, it's called pneumatic crystalline liquid. In other words, the behavior changes when you apply different amounts of force, known as the shear rate. And when you increase the amount of HA in water, the tangled molecular coils get bigger and they start to overlap, forming the hydrogel that ultimately we put in our, in our syringe and then inject. And that hydrogel lets small molecules pass through, but it blocks the bigger ones. And, and letting small ones through can allow it to hold on to some water for volume, but preventing big ones through, is, is, it's almost antibacterial, right? It helps, it, keep, it helps us keep harmful things from passing through it acts as a sort of insurance policy if our infection control isn't perfect before we break the skin with the needle. Now, the shape of the hydrogel um, and the chains can actually change based on factors, again, like concentration, molecular weight, and, and pH of the environment, or in our case, not the environment, the extracellular matrix, the ECM, uh, and the type of ions that we have present there. And if we have the good ability to change the shape, we can form complex structures which can help to support the skin by creating really uh, unique and specific properties of each filler type in the range. So understanding how HA behaves in water and how its properties can be adjusted is essential for creating the, the fillers that we want, for creating effective and safe dermal fillers for cosmetic treatments. Before we carry on, I, th I think there is something to be said about studying the stats of, of filariology, like G prime, E prime, phase angle, whatever, that the reps will give you in the brochure. I'm still not gonna go through exactly that right at this exact point in the video, and I, and I promise you, you'll see why in a bit, but I'm just bringing it up again so you don't forget its importance as we get closer towards going through it. Um, but I want to talk about modification as well. So the next thing to learn is something which every injector, especially on a stage, loves to pretend that they're an expert in, and that's cross-linking. Of course it is. Um, I've seen some awful doctors talk about this. You hear all sorts of speakers you know, at conferences and courses say, it's important for this and that. Some will say more is better, some say less is better. Some pretend to have this really deep knowledge about its toxicity, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm gonna go into a level of detail here on, on cross-linking, which until research into it advances more, 
should give you practically everything you need to know in order to pick the right filler for the rest of your career. So as you can probably guess, if you are going to try and understand cross-linking, inevitably you are gonna be immersed, maybe not fully, but to, to some extent into the world of chemistry. I am fully aware that most people don't think in the way that I do. When I, when I think of cross-linking, right, all I see in my mind is the outer electron pair orbiting an oxygen atomic nucleus being donated and shared to neutralize a charge, which is the basis of, of, of cross-linking. It's not lost on me, and, and, and I know most people clearly won't have a clue what I'm on about when I say that, so we're not gonna go fully into chemistry, but I am gonna bring it into the realms of um, layman's terms when we do go into it to some extent. Um, and I'll try and use pictures in the edit here wherever possible. So you can kind of visually see instead of having to mentally imagine complex descriptive um, statements of, of, of chemistry. So HA is a complex molecule. Why is it complex? Because there's four different types of functional groups on it. Acetamide, carboxylic acid or carboxylate, hydroxyl, and terminal aldehyde. Functional groups are like different types of handles that other chemicals can grab onto in order to create a chemical reaction. This variety of having four different ones makes it really, really chemically versatile compared to polysaccharides, which mostly just have simple hydroxyl groups. Think of functional groups as, let's say different ports on your computer the more types you have, the more wire types you can plug in, and the more devices your computer can communicate with in order to carry out different functions. Um, all of chemistry is based around interactions like these. For me, chemistry is, it's, it's the science of change. You take these particular reactants and when they combine, what you have has changed into a set of products, which are different from the reactants that you started with. And HA, when you combine it with different things, it's not different, right? The acetamide group can be turned into a free amine group through deacetylation, which, you know, that's basically where you're removing an acetyl group, as the name suggests, deacetylation. This isn't something I'm going to go into, and, and we don't need to go into it too much, so I'm, I'm not really going to explain it too much apart from tell you that it's possible. The carboxylic acid and hydroxyl groups allow for quite a variety of chemical reactions, like forming ethers and esters, um, or undergoing substitution and elimination reactions. I'm not gonna go into substitution and elimination uh, reactions, but carboxylate and hydroxyl groups are quite crucial to understand cross-linking. It gives you much more information than any filler company will educate you with if, if you understand this, even to a basic level. And after that, we have the, um, what was the last one? Terminal aldehyde groups, which again, not really relevant for our purposes of learning about HA in, in fillers and skin boosters and, and skincare and things. Their role is relatively minor compared to the others. So we, we can just uh, ignore those. Now, there are multiple methods of actually linking chains together. And we're gonna focus in on bifunctional reagents. Uh, these molecules basically have two reactive groups like the two individual claws of a crab that can each hold onto two different objects at the same time to link them together through the crab, if that makes sense. Um, there is another method that I, I, I did consider talking about it in this video. Um, it's called photo-initiated linkage. I won't go into it too much, but I'll just give you a brief bullet point intro. It's, it's basically where you, you put things into the hydrogel mixture um, that can react to certain types of radiation, and, and that reaction then starts the cross-linking process, you know, the reaction of, of firing the radiation onto it. Off the top of my head, I think there's only one filler that uses this method, um, or, or a variation of this method currently, uh, and it's called, I think, ProDefine by AQ Skin Solutions. Now, in the interest of being professional, I won't go on too long about that particular filler, but I will say 
I would never, ever use it. If you ever come across me in person, you can ask me why, and I'd be happy to share my thoughts with it. Um, but I think there will be far too many swear words to bleep out in the edit if I gave my full thoughts on it here. I'll leave my, my thoughts on that filler there. Um, now, whenever we understand how cross-linking works and what it actually does to the gels, then we understand also why it can actually cause harm at the same time. So once you understand that, you can appreciate very, very quickly which manufacturers are at least trying to stay up to date with the current level of scientific understanding that, that we have as a community. You'll be astonished um, you know, at how many brands are, are just complete nonsense. When I first started to really and, 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 and consciously pay attention to this kind of stuff, I found only two fillers in the world now that I think are actually worth considering using. Um, the, the strength and type of connections between the HA chains, that's what greatly inf influences the property of, of the gel, right, of, of the filler. So there are two main types of crosslinks that you need to know about. The first is physical crosslinks, which are formed by electromagnetism. It's kind of like a magnet putting, picking up iron filings. Um, they're not physically interlinked, but, but they're part of each other. Um, you know, but, but the, the, there's enough attraction to bring them together quite weakly, shall we say. And, and hydrogen bonds um, are a good example of this. I think I mentioned earlier that two strands of DNA that intertwine are kept together with hydrogen bonds uh, because they attract enough to click together again, like magnets, but they can temporarily be pulled apart when you need to read the genome and then go back again when you finish reading. When you heat these type of gels, the linking network is, is so easily can break down and, and that changes the properties too easily. Um, and, and the original use that you made the gel for, it, I mean, it, you might as well put it in the bin because it, it just can't be used for that anymore. Um, on the other hand, we have chemical crosslinks and not physical. Uh, and these are formed by, by creating stronger bonds, covalent bonds. Think of, of covalent bonds um, as taking the iron filings and actually welding them to the magnet. So the whole thing is now like one big thing instead of lots of little tiny things and, and the magnet all attracting each other. These type of covalent bonds make the gel more resistant to heat. Um, however, if the temperature does get way too high, even these can still break down irreversibly. Now, going to these sorts of temperatures where even these sorts of bonds break down, you're never gonna have to worry about that for, for our purpose of, of cosmetic medicine because we're only really ever gonna reach physiological temperatures of the skin and, and fat, etc. So for our purposes, these are what we want to use when making things like thermal fillers. Chemical covalent bonds, not physical hydrogen bonds, which can too easily be, be taken apart irreversibly. Now the density of the crosslinks is a key factor in, in a gel's property, in, in general gel properties in general. It's determined by the average size of the HA chains between the crosslinks. Now this density affects how much the gel can swell, how, how strong the gel is, the elasticity, and how substances can actually move through it once it's implanted. All of the things that we spoke of near the beginning of the video, basically. So when HA forms a gel, it creates something called an amphiphilic network. Basically, it can interact with both water and air. Now the balance between the elastic forces of the cross-linked HA which, which keeps it together, and the osmotic forces from the environment, which is the pressure related to concentration differences in the solution, pulling it apart, determines the gel property, the gel's properties. So in other words, you've got the gel's internal properties keeping it together, and you've got the environment trying to make it spread out evenly everywhere, just like a single scoop of sugar tries to spread out evenly throughout the drink that you're inevitably gonna be dropping it in and mixing it. So. In the sugar, there's nothing keeping the grains together, so it just flies about everywhere. In the gel, you've got the cross-linking and the covalent bonds keeping it all together. And that's the balance that, that we have to pay attention to when we're forming the things that, that go into different layers of the face 
and body. Covalent bonds keeping it together, osmotic forces from the ECM pulling it apart. Balance between the two. Now the specific chemical makeup and the size of the HA polymers between cross links dictate how dense these links are. And this in turn influences for how much the gel can swell and, and, and the size of its pores for the ECM components to travel through, etc. etc. The cross-linking also gives us viscoelastic properties, which gives us the specificity when we're forming a more advanced liquid crystal phase. The swelling when we're creating those hydrate shells that I spoke of before is related to the HA's chemical structure, and it's inversely proportional to the cross-linked entity. I know that sounds complicated, think of it this way. The more cross-linking there is, the less swelling. The less cross-linking, more swelling. Also, you'd think. I mean, I, that's what people thought up until now, and it, I get it, it makes sense. Because if there's more cross-linking, then there's less space for water to come in, right? And this, as I say, is, is what we've thought for a long time. But the industry's advancements in this technology has gotten us to the point now where you can actually have less cross-linking agent present and less swelling once injected at the same time. It seems really odd to, to think that. Um, I know, but, but bear with me. The way this is done is actually very, very simple and it's very easy to understand. And when you see how simple it is, you then understand also how much more expense there is to do it. And then you understand why nearly all manufacturers don't do it. And then you realize which manufacturers actually put a real amount of effort into creating genuinely good products instead of just bringing down costs as, as much as possible. I'll explain all of this very, very soon, but just keep it in mind for later, um, for, for now at least. So just to, to briefly summarize, right, the types of linking. In the context of, of, of medical applications, the nature of our cross-linking is crucial. Um, covalent cross-links are the ones we're bothered about, and they can be formed through polymerization, which can be initiated by things like heat or um, chemical catalysts. And once you get it started, the process can't be stopped, right? It's, it's controlled by the initial conditions. Um, photopolymerization, where a liquid polymer solution turns into a gel under light, it, it can be useful in other medical applications because of the efficiency. Dermal fillers, generally, it's, it's not something that we want. Um, in terms of the production methods for um, cross-linked HA, generally two categories, one stage and two stage linking. In one stage linking, here we, or in a one stage process, we, we use a bifunctional reagent. Think of that crab with two claws either side, remember, that can directly create a cross link bridge between HA and other molecules or other HA. That approach is, is more straightforward because it involves a single step, right? You've got a cross-linking agent, you're adding that into the HA, and then you get the cross-linked structure straight away, job done. But then you've also got the two-stage process. The two-stage process is, as you can probably guess, a little bit more complex, because you've, you've, you've initially got highly reactive HA derivatives, and the derivatives then get subjected to a second reaction that induces cross-linking. Now the two-step process gives us more control over the cross-linking process, and it can potentially lead to materials with very specific properties tailored for particular, um, uh, what's the word, applications, even outside dermal fillers. In terms of how we do it, there's, there's so many reagents, right, used for cross-linking hyaluronic acid, like diamines, uh, amino aldehydes, uh, dialdehydes, um, butadiene sulfones, um, diepoxides, and even salts of metals with, with, with a double positive um, charge. Um, and I'm sure there's more as well. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. The choice of which you use 
and the method of applying it is what gives the properties of the final HO material, um, like mechanical strength and biodegradability, and, and, and more importantly, the ability to interact with biological tissues, which is crucial in applications like ours, right? We've spent so long talking about what HA does in the skin. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about cross-linking using things like car carbodiamides, aldehydes, um, divinyl sulfone, um, two plus metallic ions, etc. But I will talk about epoxides. Well, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are probably thinking, what the hell are epoxides? I promise you, if you work in aesthetic medicine, you have heard of them, but you probably didn't know that they belong to a category of chemicals or molecules called epoxides. So about, I don't know, about 50 years ago, time making this, we had research which looked at the creation of cross-linking hydrogels, uh, and they used diglycidyl ether of polyethylene glycol. Probably seen polyethylene glycol in, in, in the back of a skincare packet in the ingredients list, and it would just be written as PEG in capitals, uh, and sometimes with a number next to it as well. This was the first crosslinker, and it's known as PEG-DE or PEG-DE. Um, this is what opened the door for us to explore even more what we can do with diepoxide chemistry. So, <clears throat> so researchers started using ethylene glycol diglycidyl ether as a bifunctional reagent, which I spoke about already, um, as well as creating trifunctional reagents, kind of like a crab with, with three claws somehow. Can't do it with my hands. Um, you know, but th these would expand the possibility of what we can do with hyaluronic acid cross-linking even more than what we have now. The process itself of creating the crosslinks with epoxides can be thought of as, say, like, I don't know, building a bridge between different hyaluronic acid molecules using the epoxide link as the bridge. So the reaction mechanism is based on how acidic or alkaline the environment is. If it's acidic, then the epoxides interact with the carboxylic acid groups in hyaluronic acid to form ester bonds. It's like linking two chains with a strong, flexible connector. Um, when it's alkaline, ether bonds are formed between hydroxyl groups, which is more like using a rigid connector. Now this method, especially when forming ether links, makes hydrogels very highly resistant to hydrolytic decomposition. Think of these as right, structures which are less likely to break down in water. Right? It's a simple way of putting it. Now, one popular method for hyaluronic acid cross-linking involves diepoxide of bis alcohols, particularly 1,4-butanedial-diglycidyl ether, which I'm sure you heard of as BDDE, and we do it in an alkaline environment. However, the problem with this approach is it's like walking a tightrope. You, you really need to put a high excess of the reagent, which makes it really challenging to quite precisely control the level of cross-linking, and, and, and then actually make a pure final product still, because the reaction mainly involves carboxylic groups, and that leads to products which are actually less stable and more prone to degradation in the body, much like a bridge that's been built in, in, in less durable materials, if you like. Um, studies over the years have, have shown another method of cross-linking HA with BDDE, um, this time in an acidic environment created by using hydrochloric acid. Um, but the problem was even in acidic conditions, the cross-linking still kind of involved carboxylic groups. Um, so researchers, after, after that, they, they published findings which established that, contrary to what we believed earlier, cross-linking in, in acidic conditions also results in a sterification at the carboxylic groups um, in alkaline conditions around pH 10. And the reaction should ideally happen at hydroxyl groups, which leads to more stable end products. Think of it like, let's say you are, you're, you're building a bridge in different environmental conditions where the stability of the final bridge depends on the initial construction conditions. For example, if you build a bridge in the Arctic, it might have been too cold 
to allow some of the materials to bond fully and thereby making the final bridge weaker. So we know essentially that it's, it's a, if it's a bit confusing to you, that if you have acidic conditions to use BDDE as the crosslinker, it doesn't quite give us what we want in terms of the durability of the gel afterwards because it's more prone to decomposition. Assuming my understanding is correct, obviously, I'm sure some scientists will correct me down below. If we use alkaline conditions, then we finally get what we want and we have a bit more stability in the final structure because of the conditions that we've done it in. And now it's crucial that you know that cross-linking agents like in carbidiamides, uh, aldehydes, um, epoxides like BDDE, they're all very toxic. You know, they're, they're, they're presence in the final product, even in tiny, tiny amounts, is actually still toxic. And we do need to purify it, which is easier said than done, unfortunately. Um, it's pretty challenging and it's very expensive to do so. So there's a big need to, to create cleaner fillers. And that's why nowadays you tend to find marketing from the companies talking about the lower level of BDDE. Because more and more people are starting to understand and realize and find out about this. You know, we've known about it for a very long time. Personally, I'm actually quite surprised that it's taken this long for the whole industry um, from the first filler to now for people to really start realizing that BDDE is something to question, at least in, you know, in the amount that it's added um, in terms of how it's used. Uh, what conditions it's reacted in, how much is removed from excess, etc., etc. Now, before I carry on, I fully appreciate that that might have been a bit full on for some of you to hear things like ether bonds and carboxyl bonding, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry. I'm going to go through why epoxides like BDDE and PEG-DE can be toxic, which, which is the more important part here. Once I've had a drink. So the actual BDDE molecule itself, I'll bring it up on screen here. It's actually really small. And when you see it, you can quickly understand why it can have toxicity. Seeing it is more helpful than having it described. Um, this is why in my head, I always like to know the atomic structure of things. Uh, if, you've, if, you, if you're watching this and you've ever been taught by me, then I'm sure you've seen me draw out complex atomic and proteomic structures to, to teach with, and th this is why. So I can just understand things instantaneously um, when I see it in my head. But when you look at the ends of the BDDE molecule, you'll quickly realize that it's quite a symmetrical molecule. This is part of the reason why it's a bifunctional reagent, why it combined with two identical things at the same time. Because what one half can do, the other half can do as well. The very ends have an oxygen, which hopefully you can see on screen now. Uh, and these have a relatively negative charge on them. This means that anything with a bit of positive charge about it somewhere is going to get attracted to it. Anything with a normal structure without any charge could be disrupted by it. Even if something's neutral, this is going to come along and upset the balance, right? So when we have something called pendant linking, which is where only one half of it is linked to HA, and the other half is unbonded or open, you know, or when we have completely unlinked and free BDDE, these charges can swim about and, and disrupt the normal structures in the area. Because of this, they can bind with proteins and, and nucleic acids, and it can all lead to toxic effects like carcinogenesis and mutagenesis. That's the whole underpinning of why BDDE is something to be questioning. If you see a manufacturer trying to make a big effort in you know, having as little of it as possible in the final product, it says something about them. It says that they're an honest group that admits the chemical problems that we face from having the linker in the mixture. Anyone who knows anything about hyaluronin knows this, like a child knows how to eat chocolate, right? 
So the manufacturers that just leave high amounts in there, in my view at least, they care more about just, just selling you anything they can to make money on it, rather than actually being chemically and biologically sound, um, which Revenus don't do. And, and I'm gonna talk about Revenus specifically now. <clears throat> so I'll go into um, specific analysis, i.e. With, with all the knowledge that I've just sprouted out, why I then, with all that knowledge, choose to use Revenus from Prolenium with all that understanding. You may not be aware of some of the behaviors and aspects of Dermophilus that form part of my judgments on which to use here. So do watch this part more than once if you need to, so that you, you can take the same criteria and apply it to what you're using if you like. Um, all I would ask is that if you're gonna do it, you do it objectively. Many of you um, watching this, you might be working with the filler company whose fillers you use, and maybe you get a discount, or maybe an opportunity to be on stage somewhere, or maybe just some kudos of, of being associated with a brand. I personally would never, ever use a product just because I get something out of it. And that's why I'm so picky too. Ignore any bias that you have and look at things based purely on facts and, and numbers to make your decisions. If you're a member of the public watching this, then I strongly advise you to ask your injector about some of the things you're gonna hear in this section so that you have comfort in knowing that the person treating you knows the products and product type inside out for, being, for, you know, for the best results and the best safety as well. Uh, I will be honest and say they, they may not like their patients questioning their product choice um, or the patients asking them things they're not clued up on because you know it'll, it'll make them look bad. But that's the force that pushes up the standard of clinicians around the world, in my opinion, uh, along with videos like this, which I believe go into far more detail than any other in the same topic. And there's a very specific reason I've done it too, which I'll share with you at the very end. Let's get, let's get started. Um, let's pick apart Revenus. Where does the raw product come from? Um, the main factories in the world are ones like Bloomage in China, Kikoman in, in uh, Japan, I think I said that right, Shiseido in Japan, uh, HTL in France. Now, I heard some rumors a couple of months ago, so I'm making this, that Shiseido in Japan are stopping customer orders just so they can make their own filler now. I think it's true um, at the time of making this video, but there is a chance I'm wrong by the time this comes out. But anyway, either way, HTL is where Evanes sources their raw HA from. I won't go through the production process again um, that produces the HA fibers, but feel free to rewind and go through that if you need. Now, of course, uh, it's pharmaceutical grade um, that gets delivered to the Revenus factory in Canada. And we've seen a certificate example too, I think, if I've edited it in by this point, that describes the batch which is sent over. When it's being dissolved in water, uh, it, can't be, it can't be general like everyday water like from the tap or a bottle of Evian. Um, it has to be specifically water for injection. This means it's, it's purified through a carbon filter. It's hit with UV radiation. And also it goes through an ion exchange process. So it's, it's literally just H2O and in there and, and nothing else. I'm sure this won't be unique. Every fellow brand is probably gonna be doing the same thing because they all have to reach the same kind of manufacturing standards in terms of safety of injection and, and release spec and all that kind of stuff. Now, at least you know how it's dissolved though. So once that's done, the mixture undergoes a process called Thixafix. I don't think you'll find data on this anywhere. So as far as I'm aware, this will be the only place you can understand what this is, uh, online at least. And, and once you do understand it, this will immediately give you this light bulb moment, which makes perfect sense. 
and doesn't seem like anything you know out of this world but it will make you question why innovation like this isn't being done by everyone else it's things like this that show me how much further along into the future this villa is compared to everything else out there now thixavix i presume is is named after the word thixotropy um, thixotropy is a property of viscous materials is where certain gels uh, or fluids which are thick or viscous when they're not moving will flow over time when they get shaken or agitated or but it's kind of mechanically stressed in some way now, then they can take a fixed amount of time to return to a more viscous state uh, viscous viscous state after that so why is it named after this word assuming it is actually named after this word and, and my guess is correct because the mixture undergoes a process where it enters a container with two arms that stick inside and they turn in opposite rotation directions like this. Uh, and when the strands go in between, they're being stretched out. The polymers then begin to elongate to their full length or closer to their full length instead of scrunching up like, like, a, like a tissue in your pocket, right? Now you might be thinking, so what? Why do that? Well, I'll explain to you now. And you'll very quickly understand why it's so, so important. You see, if you can elongate instead of scrunching it up into a tiny volume, it can be less toxic. Think about it this way. Imagine we have 30 individual monomers, so non-linked, of HA in total. And what we've decided to do is have 10 chains of three monomers in each chain for a total of 30 monomers still of HA. That means you're gonna need a certain amount of BDDE molecules to link all 10 chains together. Now imagine that you've got just two chains of 15 monomers each. This means you still have the same amount of HA monomers, 30, uh, you know, in, in whatever you're doing, but because there's only two chains, you only need one single molecule of BDDE to link them together. So there's less toxic potential of the final product. Another advantage of this is that because you're stretching them out and exposing the functional groups, you're preloading the chain with water in such a way that it, it's kind of saturated, right? So this way, when you inject it, it really can't swell that much because there's not much more water it can hold on to anyway. This is why I trust the result I see on the day with Revenes, but I can't with other brands. It's a tiny process, but it makes such a world of difference to both myself and my patients. Longer stretched out chains need less BDDE. So you see, I'm going to talk about the, the molecular weight that's used in Revenes too. And I know you'd, you'd probably think, well, why didn't he, he start with, with molecular weight uh, before describing how it's mixed? But I've done it in this way now around because now you understand that, yes, it's good to use a higher molecular weight for fillers, but that's simply not enough. Longer chains still need work because they still have the ability to curl up and need just as much BDDE as shorter chains, in which case, still got just as much toxic potential as a short chain filler, so what's the point of making it longer? The manufacturer only tells you that they use higher weight HA, but they don't tell you how they keep it stretched out, then they might not be doing anything at all for it, in which case they still, they're just using higher molecular weight as a buzzword for marketing and nothing more. Little things like this are where you need to question brands. So you can spot the exact moment that they can pull or they try to pull the wool over your eyes and hope that you don't know enough to question them. This is why understanding Thixafix is so important to me. It tells you so much about the integrity of the Revenus brand while also showing you the relative lack of innovation that some other brands have. Now, I'll mention some other brands later, I promised you I would, but for now, uh, I'm gonna still talk a little bit more about how Revenus is, is made for you. So as I said just now, high molecular weight, okay? 
in it's the region of around 2,500 kilodaltons or 2.5 megadaltons, if you like. Now, obviously, you know how that's treated, because we've just spoken about it, to ensure that there's less BDDE, BDDE used. In fact, I believe that when Revenus first, um, they, they kind of brought the product out, uh, there were a lot of questions from the FDA regarding whether they were using low molecular weight HA or not, um, because even the FDA are questioning the effects of, of low weight versus high weight. Uh, and that's the FDA, one of the most useless organizations and regulators I've seen in my life. They're the sort of authority that, you know, they think it'd be a great idea to make an ashtray that attaches to a motorbike or like a radiator that only works in the desert. Uh, if you look at my other videos, there is one where I show um, an article that exposed a level of corruption inside the FDA um, it, from the Wall Street Journal. Now, it's an interesting read, trust me. Uh, but Getting back on track, 2.5 megadalton HA, and there's 25 milligrams in every syringe across the range. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, if it's the same concentration in every filler they make, how can you have different viscosities in the range? Especially when you've spent the entire video um, showing that concentration can change viscosity. Well, changing concentration of HA in the syringe isn't the only way that you can control viscosity, right? 10% of that 25 milligrams in Revenus, so 2.5 milligrams in total, is free-floating and non-cross-linked HA that acts as a lubricant between the cross-linked parts to allow them to flow over each other. Now, the higher up the range you go, the lower that amount becomes. So when you go to all the way to the thickest filler in the range, which is Revenus uh, shape at the time of making this, there's no free floating linear HA anymore. One advantage that you have when you do this method is that you can more closely control the level of swelling across the range because the concentration is the same, remember, in every one in the range. And so if you have different amounts of HA, you have different amounts of hydrate shells created by metal ions that are attracted to the chain. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to how you can measure swelling soon so you can ask any manufacturer to provide their data for it. You'll be, in fact, you know what, you'll be amazed how many won't actually give you the numbers when you ask them. Um, but anyway, before I go into the next point about the filler, which is very important to understand, I'm gonna show you a very, another really important scientific paper that anyone injecting dermal fillers needs to know. It should be essential reading on, on a foundation course, in my opinion. Even if you find it too boring to read all the way through, which I'm sure most of you will, at least understand what it can teach you, because it's another bit of criteria that you should be judging a filler on before you decide to use it. The first critical point it shows is the particle shape um, and texture as being very important. When you have irregular shapes and textures, it's more likely to elicit a response like a foreign body reaction. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Nature creates cells that are round, not a pyramid or cube shaped, right? When was the last time you saw a blood cell that was shaped like the Eiffel Tower or like a fibroblast that looks like a Christmas tree? We're in the, where in the world are systematic right angles made in any part of nature, right? It, it just doesn't happen, you don't find it. And, and that's something that evolution has actually shaped our bodies into. We recognize those things as not being from us if they're found within the body because of, of the shape not being found in nature. So microparticles with a rough surface um, and or irregular shape can be more likely to create a foreign body granuloma as a long-term biological response. Are you surprised now that people complain about the long-term effects of filler? It's not necessarily filler they're complaining about because there's a wide spectrum of them now in terms of biological compatibility. Even migration 
is something that's challenged in this paper quite well. You know, we all think of mi migration as filler that's moving around. What we're actually talking about there is filler dislocation. Mechanical forces that move filler like muscular contraction, gravity, etc., is called dislocation. Implanted particles of biomaterials can't actively migrate. They have to be phagocytosed by immune cells called macrophages and then taken into the lymph nodes, right? I was at a talk um, a few months ago um, in, in 2023 uh, at CCR in London. And I heard Professor Daniel Ezra speak just before my talk on, on the extracellular matrix. Now, he very correctly pointed out in his talk uh, the huge problem that fillers the tear trough area cause in terms of lymphatic drainage. What he didn't talk about, though, was what I'm explaining here in terms of filler biocompatibility and how some can be engineered to be more immune friendly. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything he said was incorrect. I'm just saying that because his talk was limited by time, he didn't have a chance to go into as much detail as I clearly have done here. So whilst I completely agree with his findings that fillers can affect things like lymph drainage and lead to things like puffy appearances, especially in the eye region, uh, I would add to his findings and say that I think if fillers were engineered better, then that would most likely reduce for all the reasons I've gone into for however many, Christ, six, 15, for how many hours I've been talking so far. God, I've been talking for a long time. Um, the second critical point in the paper is, is about particle size. Now, how many brands do you know apart from Revaness that are happy to not just talk about particle size and shape, but are also as forthcoming in, in giving the data on it for their own products? Klaus Leischke showed, assuming I said his name right, I probably butchered it, showed that the true migration that I've just talked about is highly linked to particle size too and not just shape. Essentially what he's saying is that you have to avoid the 80 to 120 micron range or micrometer range if you also want to avoid the migration effect that engages macrophages. Now ideally you'll be well clear of that range when designing a filler um, and you, you'll even have multiple sizes across the range for multiple layers in, in the face. And when you combine these compatibility factors together well, the result is that you end up with no chronic inflammation, no long-term biological resp uh, response, and no true migration into the lymph nodes. That's why I, I, I never get the same puffiness in any of my patients that I treat with Ravenous, you know. Even when I do tear trough, I still don't get puffiness. And that shows me that the lymph system isn't being affected or, or not being affected as much, shall we say. Um, there's nothing being jammed into the lymph vessels that have a, a limited volume there. Like, you know, if you're taking rubbish out and there's not enough space in the bin, so you, you shove it in as, as tight as possible, right? You, you get this kind of effect uh, whenever you do tear trough or, or even just sometimes when you do tear trough. Um, I, I would highly urge you to consider a different filler. Um, and, and with that being said, what is the size and shape and texture of Revaness after I've talked about its importance. Well, the KISS and Ultra products are 200 micrometers each, and the rest upwards from that are, are 400 micrometers. So the bigger the volumizing effect that you'd like, the bigger the particle size you'd ideally have. Um, think of it as, as using, let's say, tiny bricks to make a fireplace in your, in your room, and enormous concrete blocks to build a skyscraper. All those sizes, you know, the 200 and 400 micrometers are plus or minus 50 micrometers either way, because you'll never get every single particle bang on exactly 100% perfect. The way they get the shape to be as spherical and smooth and possible is by using a process called wet milling. Essentially, it's, um, it's like, a, like a chemical version of, of putting flour through a sieve in, in your kitchen. Not that I cook, obviously, as, as many of you will know, um, until you get only particles that are correct size and shape going through, and the rest you, you just get rid of. 
In fillers, we use something called a particle size mesh. Uh, it, it's very useful when formulating skincare as well, because the size can affect how easily an ingredient dissolves before you package it. Um, and thanks to the shape playing a role in, in, in the ratio between volume and, and surface area of particles. Uh, and if you look on Revanessa's data, they very, very gladly show you a microscope image of the, the product, not just on its own, but also in comparison to other fillers like Juvederm, which clearly has, you know, to be the most commonly used filler in the world, uh, thanks to how much marketing it has and how old it is as well. Now, luckily, people are starting to wise up now, and they realize that you need to look beyond marketing, right? With, with all those things being said, what is the actual amount of BDDE and cross-linking in Revanes? Well, the modification rate originally is, I think, about 6.3 to 8.1%, um, and then it's brought all the way down to 1, point, to, sorry, to 1 to 2%, and I'm going to show you how that's done. If I've got those figures wrong, that's going to kill me. Um, the first thing to understand is that entanglement as well as cross-linking both can play a role in rheology, and therefore, ultimately, polymer behavior. If you don't know what entanglement is, it's where long chains basically just get shoved into each other, like they're, like they're caught in each other's nets almost. I'm sure I, I said that before. Um, so it's not a true cross-link per se, but it's still an interaction of sorts. And if it's present, it still also makes the body's job of breaking it down much more difficult. And, and there's higher biological risks involved, like the body trying to carry out a, a foreign body reaction again to get rid of it. The thixer fix I spoke of earlier is one way to get rid of um, scrunched up chains and, and make sure that all is stretched out as far as possible. Then, um, when it comes to adding the actual BDDE to make the cross links, uh, I believe Revness uses, I think it's around 50 degrees centigrade, and the temperature is, is very, very critical when you're doing this, if, if, if you don't already know. For instance, let's say you're about to carry out this uh, cross-linking process at a very low temperature, like four degrees centigrade. You'll still make the cross-links, but you'll probably also get entanglement and a G-prime figure that's in the thousands instead of hundreds. So the gel acts literally more like a solid piece of rock than something that can gently volumize the face. And if you do a dissolving test where you add hyaluronidase and, and measure the G-prime over time, then what you'll find is that it, it just doesn't break down either, right? So this, this idea that you just add hyaluronidase and everything dissolves, that's not true. It depends on how well it's manufactured. And if you've got that in your face, you're in serious trouble. Now, if you go in the other direction though, and you go far too high in temperature, you get so much degradation of the product that it's, it's useless, right? And that's why 50 degrees centigrade is used here. It gives a nice balance between cross-linking things together very gently, but with minimal degradation of the strands. You've got this happy medium. Um, you're in this environment, temperature environment, where neither one, happen, where neither one happens too much. Um, and once it's finished the cross-linking process, and it's gone through you know, the particle size mesh, et cetera, et cetera, then we start dialysis. Okay, the, this next bit can be well, in fact, not it can be. It, it is expensive, not just in terms of the process of doing it, but also the fact that it inherently limits how much filler you can actually sell. So to find out that this is what happens here, I, I honestly can't tell you like how, how impressed I was. Never in my wildest dreams could I ever, ever imagine something like, or some, some brand like Juvederm or Tioxane or Restylane doing the same thing here. What happens is, is the mixture undergoes dialysis, kind of like some people's kidneys in the hospital, but it goes on literally for seven full days. This is what they do to remove BDDE, endotoxin, wrong acidity, wrong osmolality, etc., etc. This is how we end up with a BDDE content as little as one to 2%. Even the endotoxin here, right? At any point over those seven days, they can take a scoop of, of, of a sample of the filler, just to check on how it's doing. They take that scoop and they run it through a test to check how much endo there is. Uh, if you're interested to do this, essentially you're using something called a gel clot test. Um, it's a common method that we use in labs to detect bacterial endotoxins. 
it's based on, on the principles of something called the limulus amoebocyte lysate assay, uh, an LAL assay or LAL assay. Uh, and the gel clot variant of this test uses the blood of horseshoe crabs to detect endotoxins. Now, when there's contact with the endotoxin, the, the blood triggers a clotting cascade and it, and it turns into a gel. Based on the amount of time it takes to clot and turn into a gel, you can then guess the amount of endotoxin that there's, that, that's estimated to be in there because we have reference scales that we can measure against. So if we walk to where the dialysis is happening, take a sample scoop, and the ideal result would, would be that it takes an enormous amount of time to, to gel clot in the LAL assay because there's such little endotoxin for us to make a reaction with. If on the other hand, we take a scoop and the gel forms much quicker than expected, then the entire batch just gets discarded because it's not good enough to go into a Revenest syringe. So if you go and discard an entire batch, then it becomes even more expensive to make because now you've got the dialysis cost, the limit on how many you can make in a given amount of time, and also you know, the, the opportunity cost of all the discarded batches now, if there are any. It takes giant balls for a company to be this stringent on itself and have the confidence to do all this. I completely salute the amount of research and development that's gone into all these processes. Um, I was, I was so impressed on the day I found all of this out, and I still am to this day. Uh, there's a guy in Revenest R&D called Tim Lee. I don't know if he prefers Tim or Timothy. I think it's Tim. Uh, and he is now like one of my science heroes. You know, I, I know how nerdy that sounds, and how nerdy that makes me look, um, but I don't care. Uh, heroes aside, if you remember back to earlier on the video, I talked about durability increasing with, with cross-linking level. In other words, the more cross-linked we are, the longer the filler can last. But I also said that was the traditional thinking, which is now becoming out of date. I'm going to show you what we now know and is more up to date. You see, it makes sense, like I said before, to think that more cross-linking will make it last longer because you know, you've got, it's like more glue, it's harder to break down. But for a number of years, I have always said, and some of you will have been in these talks, I've always said, that I personally believe there must be a way of using less BDDE, but still making it last longer by increasing biocompatibility instead of cross-linking. I've never had proof. And it's always just been something in my head as a theory based on, 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 on all my understanding of the product, like everything in this video. However, it's no longer just a theory. And people that called me mad all this time are going to have to change the way they think now because this test has now been done. Looking at the biocompatibility factors that Revenes has makes it last longer than an equivalent product because with more BDDE, you get more immune system excitation and that makes the body attack the filler to you know, try and get rid of it. But because Revenes has so little, the body almost doesn't even know it's there. So it just sits in the background, minding its own business. Now, there's no scientific paper to show you for this, but I can tell you that the test has been done and it corroborates exactly what my thoughts have been for so long. I'm fully aware some of you will disregard this because I've said I don't have a paper reference uh, to show you, to, to prove this, and that's fine. If you do disregard it, you can't disregard all the reasons that that happens, like understanding what migration actually is, understanding the effect that surface shape and, and texture and charge play in the body's acceptance of a particle, etc., etc. And all of those reasons make it so logical that more biocompatibility is better than more BDDE for not just longevity, but long-term biological response, or, or lack thereof, I should say. And all throughout history, the only reason scientific knowledge has been advanced is because certain people 
are willing to think beyond what's in existing papers by extrapolating on what we know. My theory that I had for a long time is based on extra exactly that principle. So if you, if you still think it's nonsense, I challenge you to come up with a model that disproves it and then show it in the test uh, before someone finds a model that proves it and then publishes it at least. Now the, these factors that the filler possesses are also why it performs extremely well in something called the swelling factor and cohesivity test. Typically, all, all you get from the filler companies is maybe some rheology values, which are in some you know, fancy brochure designed to make you think there's something special. Usually there isn't. Next time you get one of those, don't just ask about the particle size and shape, ask about these two as well. Swelling factor and drop weight. So what are they both? We'll start with swelling factor, which has a unit of milligrams per gram. And it's shortened to SWF, um, W in, in lowercase, S and F in, in uppercase. The average across the ravenous range, I think, is, is 3.7 milliliters per gram, I believe, but I, you know, someone from the company can comment down below if I'm wrong on that. Sorry, um, Ario is gonna kill me if I get that wrong. Um, SWF is, is literally exactly what it sounds like, right? How much the product can absorb bodily fluids to expand above its original size before it settles into an equilibrium. It's generally done in, in vitro by, by simply measuring the volume of the filler before and after the test. Now remember though, it's not gonna translate 100% to in vivo or in a live patient, because to create in a lab a composition that's 100% identical to live skin ECM, practically impossible. But because the test is standardized, you can still compare numbers between different fillers, right? So it usually at least got a relative comparison. Now, I don't know the SWF figures for every filler out there, um, but you can take it from me that it's pretty low if it's 3.7 milligrams per gram across the whole range. You may find a couple that are on par with that, but they won't be on par with the overall biocompatibility as well, which means that even if they expand less, with less biocompatibility as a whole, the immune response could be an alternative source of swelling anyway. So you, in my opinion, you have to look at you know biocompatibility and swelling factor at the same time. Um, so what about cohesivity? How do, how do we measure that? Well, there's no absolute perfect way to do this, but one of the methods we use is called the drop weight test. It's, it's very rudimentary, very easy to understand. Essentially, we, we squeeze a drop of filler through a syringe until it falls and we just measure the weight of the sample that fell to see how much of itself it can hold on to before it, it just fell down. The average across the revenous range is 27 milligrams. Um, because this test is so simple to do, you can even try it yourself at home, right? Just get some small precision scales, uh, make sure the conditions are identical, like the angle of the syringe, how hard you squeeze, the, the size of the needle, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know, as far as I'm aware, again, you'll be hard pushed to find a range that performs better. You might find a single product that might be slightly higher, but the whole range it comes from won't be higher. The average is still probably gonna be lower than Reven-S. You know, I've done ultrasound um, after, after injecting people with Reven-S. It stays where it is because it's so cohesive. Um, I'll, I'll put a video out soon just to, to prove that as well. Uh, and the outcome of having a higher drop weight is that the filler is more resistant to dislocation from dynamic forces in the face. And remember, dislocation and migration are two different things. If you've forgotten, uh, go back a little bit and rewatch. The very low swelling factor is a reason I actually don't really review my patients much anymore by default. Um, some might message me and say, you know, they need a bit more now and, and again, which I'm, I'm happy to see, but the overwhelming majority just stay as they are from the day that I do the treatment. Uh, the only swelling I have to worry about is that from the entry into the skin because there's you know there's a small bit of trauma at the end of the day that the skin then has to heal from. Apart from that, and you know, barring any unique circumstances like a special medical history or someone who goes to a sauna immediately after the appointment, even though I told them not to, you know, I have no worries about the final results anymore. Even when I'm treating areas like under the eyes, like um, like tear trough. You know, even with all that. I'm sure some of you watching this will want me to talk about other fillers to compare. 
So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I, I promised it and I'm going, to, I'm going to stick to my word. We'll start with my most hated filler of them all, Juvederm. From what I understand, Vicross is a combination of both high and low molecular weight HA. And I think there's a picture somewhere that I'll try and put on screen here of its particle shape and texture too, in comparison to Revenus. Now, I'm not gonna go into the weights of HA again, um, but if you've watched everything up to this point, I'm sure you have just as many questions as I do as to why a company in this day and age thinks it's okay to produce a filler with low weight HA. There's just no excuse for it, frankly. Um, it may have been easy to get away with in the past when people like myself weren't around to, to question what they say, but you know, I think it won't be long until more people decide to educate themselves thanks to uh, you know, brands like Revenes and see past all the rubbish that's marketed. Tioxane, another popular one. I think in the UK, it's probably like the second most widely used one, I think. Uh, I might be wrong. Now, if you look on their website, it does say that they use high weight, but it doesn't say what the exact weight is. If anyone knows, then please pop it in the comments below so that I can learn it and have it for my own knowledge. But the thing is, even with high weight and longer chains, the website says they still have up to 4% BDDE, which is double Revenus's top end of the range at 1% to 2%. And it's four times Revenus's bottom end of the range. It shows the difference in cross-linking knowledge. And two brands that both have high weight HA manage to have a BDDE level where one is literally double the other. I mean, it's actually quite embarrassing, in my opinion, to be shown up like that so dramatically. Both of these brands, as far as I'm aware, get their HA from Bloomage. No, I might be wrong. Um, but again, if, you know, if anyone knows any better, pop it in the comments so that we can all see and learn from it. Um, what else? Restylane. Um, and that's a, I, I think Restylane is also from Bloomage. Um, I couldn't get too much data, actually, on this, uh, unfortunately, but my personal understanding, which could be wrong, is that the weight of, of Restlane is, I think it's either a 1,000 or 1,400 kilodaltons, roughly. Um, so much lower than Revenus, lower molecular weight. You'll need to ask the reps to get an exact answer on the weight. Uh, and I couldn't get a hold of the BDDE level either, actually. Um, which, you know, to be honest, is all I need to know. If it's not shown off, then I guess it might be something that they're just trying to hide, perhaps. With Revenes, you can get all these numbers very, very easily. Um, I mentioned some others. What are, what are they? Miley and Kaisense, yeah. Uh, I'll mention those two. First off, if you don't know already, I'm sure I mentioned it before, they're, they're basically the same filler. The only difference as far as my understanding goes is that Miley has lidocaine, but Kaisense doesn't. Uh, now, I'm not saying they're bad or, or anything because they're the same gel with a different label in the box. Uh, I'm just pointing it out so that you can see the kind of marketing that goes on in, in, in our cosmetic medicine industry. Now, this high molecular weight, again, for these two, I'm not sure exactly what the weight is, but I do know that the BDDE number is, is a little difficult to get a hold of. Um, I'm, personally, I'm not even sure that they understand the difference between modification degree and percentage of BDDE. Uh, the modification degrees is, is basically, assuming my understanding is correct, obviously, how much of the HA chains have actually been modified or cross-linked. Uh, the BDDE percentage refers to the actual amount of BDDE concentration present. And if you look at Miley's marketing, it makes a big, it makes a big deal about things like the molecular weight and, and the BDDE and the environment in which the gel is made. And you know, these, these are things I compliment them for. Right, and I've always complimented them about this. However, I've tried several times to get what the actual weight and BDE concentration is from them. I've never been given any answers. If you're gonna say you've got a great weight and, and low BDE, but not actually say what they are, 
it, it doesn't look good to me, at least. And unfortunately, it's gonna put me off the product a little bit as well. Um, I'd also urge all of you without this kind of knowledge that I've shown you in this video to use that as a technique, right? Even if you don't know everything I've spoken about here to, to the extent that I do, what you do know is who gives you answers and who doesn't. And just that alone tells you so much about who has something to hide and who doesn't. You know, sometimes in, in choosing a product, it's not about what the company says, it's about what they don't say as well that you need to pay attention to. And it, my, my personal hope with all this is that it helps you make better decisions in your careers when you treat your patients. And the reason I, I, I genuinely am so passionate about it is because deepening everyone's knowledge like this has the power to change the entire multi-billion dollar dermal filler and hyaluronic acid industry all around the world. It would put two fingers up to so many brands that are out there and selling absolute crap, but they get away with it because they've got huge marketing budgets combined with, luckily for them, a general lack of, lack of knowledge amongst clinicians. The only other filler that I think comes close, if any of you want to try something other than Revenesse, for me, is Yvoire, um, Y-V-O-I-R-E. It's made by LG Chem, and that's LG as in the letters LG, um, like the company that makes TVs. That same company has a chemistry division that's absolutely huge, which you know, barely anyone knows about, uh, and they are genuinely fantastic fillers. I believe they're two and a half megadalton again, like Revenes, and they have a very interesting method of cross-linking too, common theme. But for me, that the negative of Yvoire is that there's only three fillers in the range. So I, I don't have as much flexibility as Revenes in, in, in the number of viscosities I can choose between. And also, there's just there's barely like any presence in the UK if, if I ever need any help with something. Whereas Reven S has you know, a big team here that I can call if there's ever any issue. Um, and they're a great team. And Sinead's my rep, Nat's the head of the UK. Um, great people. So Yvoire is, is still a great filler. And I'd rank it as one of the best in the world. But for non-chemical reasons, shall we say, I, I don't want to incorporate it into my practice. Um, if any of you have any questions about you know, anything in this video, please comment down below or, or message me on Instagram um, at Dr. Rabs, D-O-C-T-O-R dot A-B-S, or ask me in person somewhere, you're very welcome. My dream is to see the standard of product manufacturing, product choice by clinicians, and even standard of speakers at conferences and stuff become much better. Because frankly, it's terrible right now. It's, it's pathetic. There are people claiming to be experts and have no idea how HA attracts water. There are people advising to use Sculptra to treat cellulite while having no idea how they'll be inciting fibrosis. There are even people who are, who are teaching to use red light therapy, red light LED therapy, immediately after microneedling. It's atrocious because these people are out there actually treating real patients with this complete lack of knowledge. So to finish, I wanna ask any professionals watching this video the following question. When we go to conferences, uh, events, uh, courses, whether they're paid or not, we expect the best education from the most knowledgeable educators. When was the last time you went to a conference or an event or a course and you got this level and depth of knowledge that I've, I've just displayed here completely off the top of my head.